Good morning and welcome to the Justice Committee's seventh meeting of 2019. We have no apologies. Agenda item one is the start of the new piece of work for the committee. This will be an initial look at the issues surrounding the prosecution of elderly abuse in Scotland. Our work follows on from the independent review of hate crime legislation in Scotland by Lord Brackedale. And it's my pleasure to welcome to today's co uh, committee two um, panels of witnesses. The first panel starting with Leslie Kalkari, Director of Action on Elder Abuse Scotland, Adam Strakura, Head of Policy and Communications, Age Scotland, and Gordon Patterson, Chief Inspector, Adult Services with the Care Inspectorate. And can I thank the witnesses for the written evidence you've supplied to the committee, which was immensely helpful. The detail you've gone into will certainly help our um, scrutiny of this today. I refer members to pa paper one, which is a note by the clerk, and paper two, which is a private paper. And we now move to questions from members, starting with John Finney. Good morning, panel, and, and thank you, yes, indeed, for, for your statements. Uh, Mr Patterson, I'd like to, to, to comment on, on something that, that you, you qualify comments by saying we would ordinarily be wary of an arbitrary approach based on age that would have the effect of perpetuating a perception of older people as members of a demographic distinctly lacking the ability to protect themselves from harm or abuse. I think that's an important statement. But can the panel outline what's the extent and nature of elder abuse, please? Who'd like to start? Leslie. Um, Leslie Carkery from Action on Elder Abuse. Um, so according to, to our research and recent prevalence studies, we estimate that around 9% of over 65s in Scotland have experienced some form of elder abuse, which may include physical, sexual, financial, psychological or neglect. Uh, now, we would say that this 9% is very likely to only be the tip of the iceberg, because from our experience, and I'm sure others will corroborate this, many older people are very reluctant to speak up. So we believe that the issue, the ex extent of elder abuse is actually much higher than that. Thank you. The other panel members, please. Yeah, um, I concur with that. I think the uh, some studies from the World Health Organization put the figure near 16% of older people could be subject to elder abuse. And when you put in the Scottish context about 1.65 million people of the age of 65 in Scotland, and even at the lower end of this, near 10%, that's a, a huge number of people who could be subjected to, quite frankly, terrifying abuse. So there is, there is a, a lot of people um, this affects. Um, but, you know, from the lower end, you know, you can see the best part of 150,000 people in Scotland, this could affect upwards of maybe 200,000 people. So I think it's really important that action is taken. And before coming to Mr Patterson, are you able to say how the, that group of people is dispersed across Scotland? Are, are they concentrated in any particular, uh, not necessarily just a geographic area, but sector? Or it's very difficult to tell. Um, the, the best statistics that we can get in Scotland are based on adult support and protection statistics, which are collected in each local authority area on a biennial basis. Unfortunately, due to differing ways in which those statistics are collected, it's very difficult to get a, a national picture. Um, from our own experience, we run a, a national helpline. Um, we're inevitably finding we get more calls from more urban areas, but I don't think that's an indication of there being more elder abuse in urban areas. We tend to find that sometimes remote areas are less well served in terms of um, other support services and access to information. So it's sometimes difficult to let remote areas know that support is available and they're perhaps less likely to speak up. Thank you. Mr. Patterson, do you have a comment on that? I, I think... Um, I would be deferring to my colleagues in relation to their more specialist knowledge around the prevalence of elder abuse. Um, I think for us, part of the challenge uh, is, is always around definitions here, um, where we're registering and inspecting 13,500 care services across Scotland, including, for example, 832 care homes for older people. We're forever debating uh, and wrestling with the challenge around when does poor care become neglect? When does neglect become harmful? When does that harmfulness constitute criminality? And how then 
are, eff are effective prosecutions pursued in terms of uh, the public interest and the reliability of witnesses and, uh, and being able to prove beyond reasonable doubt. So I think it's very difficult to put a figure on, on the prevalence and I think it is also difficult to um, deduce from that whether or not there are particular challenges in particular parts of the country. I think people in ru rural and remote areas are, are no less vulnerable than people uh, in, in urban areas, but we wouldn't purport to have robust statistics on the prevalence. Would any of the panel be able to say uh, more likely to be subjected to abuse if you're in an institution rather than your house, or is there anything that would support that? Our evidence suggests that you're much more likely to be harmed or abused in your own home compared to care settings. Um, we find that the majority of abuse, abuse takes place by family members, um, which is a fairly even split between partners and spouses, as well as grown-up children and other relatives. We do hear of cases of um, carers or other health professionals um, being the perpetrators, but in the vast majority of cases, it's family members, someone who's very well known to the older person in their own home, unfortunately. I'd just add to that, in, if you consider the length of time that somebody might be living in their own home and compared to a care home, you know, these people are not subject to necessarily one instance of some kind of abuse, but maybe something of a prolonged period of time from a family member, a close friend, or a paid-for care worker in their own home. So I can sort of concur with Leslie on where the balance may be, but it's obviously, for a lot of people, elder abuse will happen over a long period of time and not just that one one-off occasion. We also find out one of the biggest concerns that we're dealing with is the problem of loneliness and social isolation amongst older people, which is one of the biggest factors why older people choose not to report harm or abuse. We've heard of cases of older people actually choosing to put up with abuse rather than risk their grown-up son not coming to visit. We've heard of grown-up children bribing older parents to say, if you tell anyone, you're not going to see your grandchildren. Um, and for a lot of older people, the fear of loneliness is actually greater than the fear of abuse, so they're actually choosing to put up with it rather than tell anyone, unfortunately. You may also have seen in our written submission, we've also heard evidence of some older people actually handing back free call blockers, which are intended to block nuisance calls. And they told us the reason they were handing them back was that they were so lonely that they would rather speak to scammers than be on their own. We would class scams and doorstep crime as a form of abuse as well. So I think that really gives you an indication of some of the reasons why so few people speak up about it, unfortunately. Some of my colleagues are going into the criminal aspects and issues around offences and that. And uh, you've covered it, Mr. Patterson, with the escalation of what would factors you'd consider before something would constitute a, a criminal matter. The other two panel members, is it your view that all as aspects of elder abuse should be considered as criminal? Not always, although one of the problems that we find is that one of the main differences between the way that elder abuse and domestic abuse is treated is that when it comes to domestic abuse, it appears to be a very empowering approach. It's all about empowering the woman to take decisions and take actions to keep herself safe, to get out of that situation and to seek justice through the criminal justice system. Unfortunately, when it comes to older people, the prevailing view seems to be quite a paternalistic view of a poor older person who needs our help, needs our support. So we tend to find that cases of elder abuse are primarily social work rather than prosecuted. Um, we tend to keep an eye on media stories regarding abuse in care homes, for example. Abuse in private homes aren't, aren't as well publicised. We tend to find that quite often the, the result is that the, the carer is perhaps struck off the register or disciplined or sacked. We will always write to the media and say, well, why was a criminal charge not considered here? We tend to find that if it's a younger person or a child, criminal charges will be considered in the first instance. When it comes to an older person, sadly, they're not. The, the first response tends to be adult support and protection, which we agree is good, but we can't forget about the criminal aspects as well. If we don't, older people will not speak up and the problem of elder abuse will continue because there's no effective deterrent. I back up a lot of what Leslie says there, particularly with the adult support and protection. You know, it's, it's unique in the United Kingdom, the way that Scotland approaches this. But when you look at the kind of criminality, part of this is to think back and the result of the actions upon the older person and how it impacts their life. A lot of this is psychological, can be physical, financial abuse as well. So it might not just be that one act, but again, going back to the point over a prolonged period of time, it could have a significant impact on this person's life. And that's where the sort of criminality would come into judgment uh, of prosecutors. I, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to 
um, undervalue the contribution that adult support and protection has made in Scotland over the last 10 years. Uh, I think it's important to recognise that our experience, distinct, distinct from colleagues, is that adult protection is not just about social working, whatever that is. Um, it, it's about a multi-agency response that gives due consideration to how protective measures should be um, brought by all parties involved, by social work, by housing, by health, by police. And the active involvement of Police Scotland and the police concern hubs uh, is an effective means of uh, those who have a responsibility for investigating and reporting crime, i.e. Police Scotland, for doing so in relation to uh, any number of adult protection concerns that are considered day in, day out across Scotland. So I think prosecutions fall from adult protection. Uh, what I'm not sure about is whether an additional offence is necessary to address the lack of some of those prosecutions being successful. Um, but that's maybe a matter for the second stage of this panel to consider. OK, thank you very much indeed. If we could look just a little bit at the, the extent of it and only 9% apparently being a, a very under-reporting of it, could you perhaps explain, Mr. Patterson, how you record these incidents? You said that you know there are various types of incidents. How does the care inspector actually record them? So, in relation to our strategic scrutiny of the work of social work and health and social care partnerships, jointly with other regulators, it wouldn't be for us to record. We would we would be going out to inspect how social work departments and health and social care partnerships are effectively discharging their duties in relation to adult support and protection in the same way as we do for self-directed support or, or, or integration now. Do that. How is that written up then? It's written up by the adult protection coordinators and the staff employed within the local authority or, or more likely now within the local authority but working within the health and social care partnership and is reported, uh, as Leslie has alluded to, in the adult protection conveners biennial report that is submitted to Scottish Government for their consideration across the country. Getting at, is there anywhere the age of the person is recorded? Would the care inspector record that and have a note of the, just a, a light note even, of the type of abuse that, um, or incident that had been recorded? There would be information recorded in the biennial reports that would be pulled together nationally. And there is now, again, a national strategic adult protection forum that is actually meeting next week that's convened by, uh, chaired by uh, Claire Hawhey, the Minister for, Public, uh, for Mental Health. In relation to registered care services, we would probably have more information in relation to the prevalence of, of abuse and harm. Uh, we require uh, registered care services to notify us of any incidents that fall into that category. Um, we record them and we monitor how they are affected and, and what actions taken in response. So we would know that there are a number of referrals that would come to us in relation to um, elder abuse, specifically, I suppose, from care services that are supporting older people where there are allegations of harm. But again, those would be referred to the local adult protection team in, in the Health and Social Care Partnership for them to investigate. We would oversee how that progresses and we might take enforcement action uh, in relation to that care service if it was necessary. Getting out, do you think it would help if it was flagged up the age of the person and that this could potentially be a case of elder abuse, you know, something quite distinct? So if you revised how you reported and, and actually made sure that um, the age of the person was recorded, then that would be a kind of starter for 10 almost. That would be a start for 10 in recording the age of people who were the subject of allegations of harm. Not all these allegations are substantiated, Absolutely. but I would be um, less concerned about their age and more concerned about their vulnerability. Um, very often we are dealing with people who happen to be under the age of 65 who are the subject of abuse. Uh, and I, I think that potentially becomes one of the most significant challenges for this committee. But isn't the problem, if you don't record the age, you can't tease out the instances when people are targeted because they're seen as an easy target from the age you're making the assumption um, is just vulnerability and we'll put them under one particular heading. Is that not missing an opportunity to tease out this particular issue? 
I think if you subscribe to the view that there's something happens on your 65th birthday that makes you an older person, and, and by virtue of that, there's a need to classify you differently, to treat you differently, to view you differently, then that, that might be the case. Um, but as I think Lord Brackadale said, the question around proving age hostility, I think, is quite significant and quite difficult. I know others have, have questions, but I'm going to move to Jenny on the, the barriers and then bring in the supplementaries from that, because I'm feeling the supplementaries may cover that. Thank you, Convener. Um, good morning to the panel. Yeah, in terms of those barriers to reporting, um, Leslie Carkery, in your submission, you talk about um, a reluctance to report. You mentioned that previously this morning, uh, an unfair perception or maybe a stereotype that older people make less credible witnesses. And in Social Work Scotland's submission, they say that we also have to understand that many victims or, of harm may not wish their relative to be prosecuted. So I just wonder then, does the panel acknowledge this tension uh, between you know, victims not wanting to, to go forward with prosecution if it is a family member? Yeah, definitely. That's an issue that we come across quite regularly. Um, we have a, a national helpline where we, on a daily basis, speak to either older people or family members who've been affected by elder abuse. Um, I would point out that the vast majority of people who call our helpline are actually family members. Actually, a very small proportion of older people themselves call the helpline. Um, without speaking to them directly. It's difficult to know why, but I think we can safely assume it's because they find it difficult to report loved ones. Um, our definition of elder abuse makes a clear distinction between situations where there's an abuse of an expectation of trust and opportunistic crime. So our definition focuses on situations where there's an expectation of trust which has been broken, which is why we're specifically dealing with family members, friends, carers, health professionals, for example. We wouldn't be including things like doorstep crime, bogus tradesmen, scams and things like that. Um, so for the type of crime that we're dealing with, it's very difficult for, for older people to speak up. I mentioned earlier that um, the that family members are more, most likely to be the perpetrators. The latest prevalence study, I think it was 66% of perpetrators were family, which was broken down into a fairly even split between partners and spouses and other family members. In our experience, it tends to be grown-up sons followed by grown-up daughters that are the, the most common perpetrators after partners or spouses. Sometimes older people themselves will call and discuss concerns with their grown-up children, or sometimes it's other family members. I occasionally take helpline calls, and some of the people that I have spoken to have told us they're in a bit of a quandary. They are so embarrassed and feel so guilty that their own children could do this to them, but at the same time, it's still their children, and they don't want to report them. We find that it's financial crime that's the most commonly... Financial abuse that's the most commonly reported type of abuse to us, and I think this is fairly consistent across various local authority areas as well. Um, we quite often hear of abuse of trust around things like power of attorney, um, where we tend to find there's two types of people who are abusing power of attorney. First are the people who know that it's wrong, and they know they're using it as a means to steal from an older relative. And secondly, there's also people who actually don't realise that they're misusing it. I think there's a lot of misconceptions around what power of attorney is and what it can and can't be used for. I think some people, if they become a power of attorney for financial powers, they believe that that gives them the power to spend that money however they would like. Um, we sometimes have callers to our helpline who will actually use the term such as but it's my mum. She would want me to have this money. She would want me to spend it on such and such. She wouldn't mind. It would be coming to me anyway. And we'll say, but this isn't your money. Have you asked your mum? Have you asked your dad? Do they want it to be spent in this way? So a lot of people genuinely don't realise they're doing the wrong thing. And for the people that it's happening to, it's very difficult to report that. We've heard of older people who are struggling financially and they're actually going into debt because they don't want to stop giving money to their children. It's, it's a very, very difficult issue, and we can give them all the support and encouragement we want, but if they don't want to report it, there is nothing we can do about it. That's that person's right not to report it, which is why we need to be a bit more creative about how we encourage them to seek support elsewhere. Now, I mentioned earlier that a lot of pe older people are very lonely, so they might think, but if I don't give my son that money, he's not going to visit, I'm not going to see the grandchildren, he's not going to drive me out and about. So they choose to put up with it, which is why we need to start thinking about, well, what other support can we signpost that older person to so that they're not completely reliant on their abuser to meet their social needs or perhaps their care needs? So we need to think of it in those points, from those points of view as well. It's not always about criminalisation, but at the same time, 
we do feel a lot more needs to be done to criminalise this type of behaviour so that there is a real deterrent and so that children or other family members who are thinking of doing this will, will think twice about it if they see that there is a proper deterrent. Thank you. I would just say that if you consider the, the relationships, the dynamic of the relationships are very interdependent with the rest of their family. And as Leslie's rightly said, that most of the perpetrators of this are family members, close family members. For a lot of people, or especially older people, they're going to have to think about what support is available to them once they report something as well. They're not on their own because of this issue of you know, loneliness and isolation. I mean, at the worst extreme, there's one person in every street in Scotland who feels lonely. An older person in Scotland feels lonely all or most of the time. And actually, for a lot of older people to understand how they get access to the right kind of information is important too. You know, half a million you know, Scots over the age of 65 that do not have access to or use the internet. So for most, the kind of information about what is wrong what you need to do about this just isn't at their fingertips. You know, Leslie's Charity has a helpline, Age Scotland also has a national helpline. We speak to people and their families too about instances of abuse. So the first question they'll come up with is, what do I do about this? Where do I go next? So for a lot of people, it's not just about that report. The barrier is actually what happens if I report this and I'm ostracised by my family or something happens there? Where do I go? What support's in place for me? Um, and I think if you look across the, the piece, that that becomes a big question in the future for lots of these types of very serious crimes, that how do we support older people who are reporting them as best we possibly can? Thank you. Um, in terms of prosecution, then, we've seen evidence from Police Scotland and uh, Age Scotland about specialist support for victims um, of elder abuse, and they both agree on that. And, Leslie, I was quite taken by your submission because you point to the specialist staff and you give an American example of units um, within police and prosecution services. So, in terms of the barriers at prosecution level, what, what, are they, what do they look like currently and what more could be done, potentially, in terms of prosecution? Um, I, I pointed to an example in my submission around the case of um, Lynn Harrison, whose elderly aunt had experienced quite severe financial abuse, where £44,000 had been stolen at the end of her carer. Um, now, I, I th although that was a, a terrible example, we found it was a good example of highlighting some of the, the problems with the system. I think I included a quote there where she talked about consistently having to badger the police for the case to be taken seriously. Um, Unfortunately, not everyone has someone like that, has a persistent person who's willing to do that badgering. And when they get told, no, we're not going to investigate it, we'll quite often not push it any further. The more that that happens, the more older people think, well, such and such reported it to the police and nothing happened. So they're less likely to report it. Um, we also came across a case a few years ago where an older lady had dementia and lived in her own home. Um, she had a, a carer who would come in twice a day to, to meet her personal care needs. And her grown-up son believed that the carer was stealing from her, directly stealing from her purse. He was so adamant that the carer was stealing but didn't have any evidence to instigate either criminal proceedings or an adult support and protection investigation. But he was so adamant that something was happening that he took the drastic step of installing cameras in his mum's home. Lo and behold, they found evidence to show that the carer was stealing and it eventually got taken to court. Now, we feel it shouldn't have to come to such extreme circumstances for cases like those to be taken seriously. He found that because his mum had dementia, any time he reported to anyone, people would just say, but she's got dementia, she's getting a bit muddled, she's making it up. Now, sometimes that does happen, we do appreciate that, but it doesn't mean that these cases should automatically be dismissed and put down to confusion or memory problems. All cases need to be investigated on their own merits. OK. Uh, supplementary, Liam Kerr, Fulton, followed by Rona. Thank you, convener. <clears throat> Gordon Parson, you mentioned earlier on that uh, we're wrestling with definitions, and at some point this committee will need to seize hold of uh, defined terms. Um, Leslie Carkery, in your submission you talk about older people, or the definition will be older people. Uh, we've got a paper that talks about elderly abuse to people of 60 or over. Um, so the question I put to you is, what is elder? What is an older person, or what do you think it should be? This is the issue that I, I think I have most difficulty with, and I think the care inspectorate would, insofar as we have uh, consistently sought to promote the notion um, that people of age should not be defined by what they lack, that we should not have a deficit-based approach, that people 
as they age, continue to be people who can contribute, who have hopes, ambitions, experiences, wishes. Um, I think the challenge therefore then is that there are some people who are 64 who are as vulnerable as people who are 84 and that nothing magical happens on that birthday. So for me, the challenge is how do we define something that allows a definition to either pick up on age hostility, and that may be at any age, because younger people with dementia or learning disability, albeit they may already be, have a protected characteristic under the Equalities Act, which is, I think, where, where this is at odds. Um, how, how do we ensure that, there, that there's sufficient protection there? Because there are significant variations between um, you know, people who are 65 and 85 and, and 105. And, and what we're working with is, is quite probably quite an outdated age uh, cutoff, which is a reflection that 50 years ago, 65 was quite elderly, and now 75 is, is not at all elderly. So I think there are real challenges around this. And I think the questions are not about chronological age, but the fact that people at times in their lives have degrees of vulnerability, frailty, infirmity, and, and, and that's what can be preyed on by people who are uh, choosing to target them. Very good question, and actually it's something that at Age Scotland we think about all the time. You know, as a national charity for older people, actually the first age we're looking at is people who are 50, and it's not just by virtue of you're vulnerable or anything like that. It's entirely because you know we know that in the workplace that's when age discrimination kicks in. But throughout the kind of age spectrum, there will be different priorities in terms of age. So, but I think if you're looking at elder abuse and you look at the actions behind it, being family members or caregivers or close friends who are taking advantage of somebody who may be vulnerable, unable to report things, might have assets, for instance, actually part of the real question is looking at you know, their, their capacity as well. So, I mean, it's a very difficult one to think about um, and having an arbitrary date. But if you could do consider this point about who the majority of the perpetrators are being kind of close family members who are grown up adults doing this, then there comes a point where it might actually be looking at someone from your mid 50s to 60, 65. So it, is a, it could be quite fluid, actually. Do you have anything to add on that, Leslie, or yeah, shall I come um, back? Yeah, I will read you our definition of elder abuse, which uh, we produced about 20 odd years ago and has subsequently been adopted by the World Health Organization and is used internationally. So our definition of elder abuse is a single or repeated act or lack of appropriate action occurring within any relationship where there is an expectation of trust which causes harm or distress to an older person. Now you'll notice the last two words, we have older person there and we don't have a definition of what that means. We have the same tensions um, around putting a, a number on it. We posted something on Facebook a few weeks ago and I think we deliberately said, please complete this survey if you're aged 55 or over. And quite a few people got back and were quite offended that <laughs> we would class a 56 year old as an older person. Um, for us, the number shouldn't actually matter. In terms of prosecutions, we believe that older people as a group are deliberately targeted because quite often, rightly or wrongly, they are perceived as being more vulnerable by some people. So for us, that takes away some of the confusion in terms of trying to determine whether a victim was deliberately targeted. It shouldn't actually matter whether we have a definition of that person being vulnerable. The fact is, quite often, older people as a group are perceived to be vulnerable. So we'll use examples of an older person who might be frail and blind they might not think of themselves as vulnerable, and perhaps they're not, but the fact is the person who perpetrated that crime, it was very likely that they chose them because they th perceived them to be vulnerable, whether they are or not, and I think that's the important point to make here. Uh, I, think, I think we'll come back on, uh, members of the committee will come back on, on that exact point later on, uh, but uh, I find Gordon Patterson's point very persuasive on this, that it, it, un unless you draw a category, it's going to be very difficult to say who's within that protected category. Uh, and therefore, the follow-up question would be, do you take a view on the idea that actually what we should be protecting here is age as a general characteristic, like we've done in employment legislation, for example, and say you shouldn't discriminate based on age, uh, rather than trying to take an arbitrary uh, line and say, well, at 64 years and 364 days, you are not within this category, but it's on your 65th birthday, you are. Would that be a better approach? Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, I've always had a bit of a tension that um, 
unfortunately, the, the name of our organisation includes the term elder abuse, and we've all come to accept over the last few years that it's actually not a term that's very commonly used. We tend to work very much within the adult support and protection framework, where actually the term abuse is very, very rarely used, either as the term elder. So we talk about harm or abuse or exploitation of an older person. Um, again, there's no definition of, of what an older person is there, but for us, it's the it's the vulnerability and perhaps the frailty that's the issue. Um, it might be quite useful for the committee to consider the definition used in the Adult Support and Protection Act. Um, they don't use the term vulnerability, but it's clearly intended to describe vulnerable people. Now, I would point out that that covers any person over the age of 16, but perhaps that could be a, a route to consider because it will also consider perhaps younger adults with, with learning disabilities. Um, and I do think in terms of consistency that that would be a useful um, crossover. Useful, thank you. Does anyone else want to comment on that point? Just going to say it's certainly worth reflecting on, but if you consider <coughs> Lord Brackadale's review into hate crime and looking at a statute of aggravation on age in general, obviously that's a kind of separate thing to what elder abuse is. Um, but that's also a very welcome move in terms of that statute of aggravation looking for the top up after an offence has been caused. But notwithstanding the fact that we know there are a huge number of older people, again, age, uh, sometimes somewhat fluid, who are subject to these types of crimes for a long, prolonged period of time. Um, you know, again, as, as Gordon rightly said, you know, you could be 75 and still be fit as a fiddle, uh, or not seen as as old or elderly, which is, which is again, is a, a terrible phrase to use. Um, so it's certainly something we'll have to reflect upon if that kind of cut off point. But again, I think the Brackadale review, looking at age as a general thing, should be a protected characteristic, is a good place to start. But very much looking back to the impact that these crimes have on older people in general is something to really pivot around. Um, Mr. Patterson, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I would just add in relation to adult support and protection that, that, that the three-point test that applies in consideration of whether or not an intervention is, is warranted in relation to adult support and protection is that a person is unable to safeguard their welfare, property rights and interests, that they're at risk of harm and that they are more vulnerable. So the word vulnerable is in there because of age, infirmity, disability. No, sorry, not age. I think that's the point that Leslie's making. Um, because they're affected by disability, mental disorder, illness, or physical or mental infirmity, are more, more vulnerable to being harmed than adults who are not so affected. So the application of, or the addition of the word age um, may not make much difference there because it isn't age in its own. It's the vulnerabilities that can sometimes be associated with age that are probably already covered by the words disability, mental disorder, illness, physical, mental infirmity. So I think the adult protection legislation is robust uh, and I think it does allow that multi-agency response to situations where someone by virtue, virtue of their age has a degree of vulnerability associated with frailty or social isolation and interventions can follow. I think what is important in relation to adult support and protection is the need to reinvigorate the agenda around support and not just the protection elements because that's where we begin to address social isolation. That's where we begin to tackle issues around power of attorney being misused and that's where we have dialogues with people about capacity and consent and their confidence in, in, in being reliable witnesses and, and making complaints. Um, Rona then Shona. Okay, thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Um, my question really relates to a line of questioning uh, from the convener to, to Gordon Patterson around reporting and um, sort of definitions of abuse. You said um, early on, when does neglect become harmful? Um, can you maybe explain that? I would have thought by definition neglect was harmful. So, yeah, I think the challenge is, is around the application of that three-point test in adult protection, but the situations that we often encounter... Um, so, for example, I was interested in the submission from Protect um, that talked about whistleblowing, it talked about care services, um, and it talked in great detail about some of the challenges that care staff have in raising concerns about situations of, of harm or abuse or, or, or neglect of poor care. I, I researched it further and I was able to identify from the sources that they produced that their work is predominantly in England in care services. 
Um, they talk about um, the Healthcare Commission, which is the regulator that preceded Care Quality Commission in England. They talk about the percentage of care workers who uh, are whistleblowers relative to those recorded in the census in England and Wales. So the situation that they're describing is quite different to what we encounter in Scotland. This, as, as the care inspector, we, unlike most other regulators, have a statutory responsibility for receiving complaints. In each of the last three years, we've received over 4,500 complaints about care services. Uh, and in the most recent years, about 45% of those have related to care homes for older people. Now, whether it's a complaint or whether it's an adult protection referral, the response should be robust and the investigation should be thorough. What we encounter, though, are situations where it is difficult to substantiate what has occurred, or there are situations where uh, reports are made to us where peer-on-peer -peer incidents have occurred, and there are high numbers of those where someone with dementia has maybe lashed out at somebody else, or there's been sexually disinhibited, or, or, or whatever. Um, so this takes us into the territory of what is the most effective response in each of those circumstances. And it isn't always about, you know, we're going to involve the police. Uh, it isn't always about a full investigation. Some of it's about managing distress and uh, stressful behaviour. Some of it's about uh, us as a regulator intervening. We had a couple of situations last year where, as a result of whistleblowing for our complaints procedure, encourages staff to blow the whistle and to do so anonymously or confidentially. We closed five care homes in Scotland last year as a result of poor care, and that's unprecedented in our history. In two of those situations, the intelligence that we gathered in relation to what action was necessary was informed by staff who were whistleblowing. Um, what we have is lots of examples of where we have engaged with Police Scotland in those situations and prosecutions have followed. Um, we would always refer to the Mental Welfare Commission, to the, to the Social Services Council and to the, the Nursing and Midwifery Council. We are currently engaged with Police Scotland in relation to some cases that I need to be sensitive about discussing because they're sub judice, but they are for the first time pursuing possible prosecutions under the Health, Tobacco, Nicotine and Care Scotland Act, a new piece of legislation that allows the courts to consider taking action in relation to ill treatment or willful neglect by a member of care staff or by a care provider. So that there, there is a lot going on in this, this, this area which, and I think in relation to that legislation, we need to recognise how recent it is. We need to recognise that these are the, probably the first cases that are coming through. Um, and it may well be that increasingly it's used as a way of tackling some of the challenges that arise in care services. Just a, a quick follow-up to that. So if you received several, um, say, complaints or whistleblowing about a particular care um, place that's about neglect, um, you, you would look into that and take action? We, we might not wait for several. We would, we would put that together with other intelligence. When did we last inspect? What did we find when we last inspect? Had there been notifications from that service about incidents, accidents, a change of manager, which can be a critical point in, in a care, care home's um, journey? And we would take action. We would bring forward an inspection. We would carry out an investigation. Or we would make a referral to the local health and social care partnership, and they would initiate adult protection measures. We may at that point also make referral to the Scottish Social Services Council or to the Nursing and Midwifery Council who can take interim suspension orders pending investigations. But we would also make demands on the provider that they were managing their uh, service effectively and that they were taking robust action, either in terms of disciplinary action or in terms of an internal investigation. Okay, thank you. Sure. No. I just wanted to pick up where uh, we got to earlier when Gordon Patterson, you um, talked about the definition within the adult um, uh, support and protection legislation, which I think is, is probably getting to the heart of what we're talking about here, rather than it being vulnerability based on someone's chronological age, which I think the rest of the panel have said would be very hard to do. It's vulnerability, it, it's about the, the vulnerability based on whatever. Um, whether it's its age or, or someone with a learning disability that that is there for the factor of becoming a target f for from whoever. 
So I, I guess I just wanted to ask, do you think that there is a gap or an opportunity to build on what is within the adult support and protection legislation around a potential statutory aggravation that's not specific to older victims. So I guess it would send out a message that um, this is a very serious crime and is judged as such and therefore um, would be regarded by the, the courts as, as something perhaps more serious than it's perhaps in society being viewed as at the moment. Do you, is that something you would have sympathy with or do you think there's no gap at the moment that needs to be addressed? I think that would be important. I think that would be significant in terms of raising awareness and I think that would send out a strong message. Whether or not that would either deter people from committing those offences or increase the likelihood of people coming forward and reporting those offences and therefore then in a prosecution being infected, I'm not sure about. I think the issue is about how can we ensure that people are not social isolated, how are people given supports to enable them to, to have advocacy, to, to have um, whatever other supports are necessary to, to enable them to um, be confident in reporting and progressing concerns that they might have about, as we've heard, often familial abuse, and how will people be reassured that doing so won't result in reprisal or, or, or in losing whatever it is of value that that family connection brings to them. So I think for me the question would be about how much more effectively can we emphasise the support element of adult support and protection. And, and if that was about uh, some sort of awareness raising campaign, some public campaign, any, un any number of measures could be taken to, to heighten awareness about this difficult, difficult issue. Um, and that might in itself be able to be addressed within the existing definitions within adult, adult support and protection, that, that, that heightened awareness rather than necessarily um, any revision to how, how the three-point test is worded. I guess um, there are quite a lot of parallels though, with domestic uh, abuse legislation and, and recognition that, um, that society has a duty to... Um, send out a very clear message um, to perpetrators and potential perpetrators and that because someone's vulnerable it shouldn't really make them be treated any differently in the eyes of the law in terms of their rights to to be protected and redress and I guess it's about getting that balance I hear what you're saying about the complexities of family relationships but some of those arguments potentially were maybe used previously in um, domestic abuse situations that these things are complex and that you know it's about supporting the victim it is but it's also about I think the law being very clear um, that this is a crime and whatever the complexities going on within the the, the, the household potentially, which is I think where we've, where there is a, a, an issue um, that, that needs to be addressed. You know, would that not send a message that you know this will be treated seriously and because of someone's vulnerability, they're not going to be less protected in the eyes of the law? Do you see what I mean? I, I mean, I think I'll defer to my colleagues probably to have their opportunity to respond. I, 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 I agree with what you're saying insofar as that heightened awareness and that added protection would um, align itself to the kinds of approaches that have led to the, 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 the domestic abuse legislation. But maybe the challenge there is to give that time to play out and see, see how that, that develops. Um, I know there have been a lot of um, debates around whether age should be singled out as a specific car uh, category. Uh, and perhaps considerations around is this quite a, an ageist approach and we shouldn't be treating older people as a, as a separate group in case it marginalises them. I would totally disagree with that. I believe that if we can treat domestic abuse as a very unique issue with its own sort of um, prosecution system and its own dynamic, its own processes, we also have um, specific protections for victims of hate crime, uh, very specific and very comprehensive protection for children, then why on earth can we not see the protection of older people as a distinct issue as well? 
said yourself earlier um, that it would be very difficult to define what that age is, and it's actually about the vulnerability of the person rather than their chronological age. So I guess the point I was trying to get to was, are, are we really talking about here whether or not there should be a, a, a statutory aggravator as one way forward, potentially, that's about the vulnerability of the person rather than their chronological age? I, th I think there's possibilities for both. Now, forgive me, I'm, I'm not a legal expert, and you may have seen... A, I made a suggestion in my um, written submission. I don't know if this is legally possible, but I, I would quite like the idea of perhaps having both systems where there could be the statutory aggravation on the basis of vulnerability, which takes into account any age group and it's focusing on vulnerability, but also a specific standalone offence of elder abuse for quite different cases. Now, for us, um, the specific offence would be our preference, um, possibly both at the same time. If that wasn't deemed workable, we would very much support a statutory aggravation on the basis of vulnerability. And I think it totally makes sense for that to be available for, for all age groups. Um, your point about using the definition of vulnerability under the Adult Support and Protection Act is something we would very much support because it works very well. The only thing I would point out is that there is already a, a problem, as I said right at the start, around older people's, the harm and abuse of older people being treated in a paternalistic way. And although adult support and protection is very good in terms of supporting, protecting and safeguarding older people, it's not part of the criminal justice system and there is a danger that it could lead to the problem we're already seeing where people don't consider the criminal aspects and they're just focusing on the, the safeguarding side. We would also point out that although the domestic abuse framework in terms of prosecutions works very well, the committee will be aware that that only applies to partners and ex-partners. We've always been quite concerned that that doesn't take account of situations where it's grown-up children or other family members who are the perpetrators. Um, we had a lady called our helpline a few months ago who was being physically and financially abused by her grown-up son. Now, according to the definition, the three-point test under adult support and protection, she wasn't vulnerable enough for support under that framework because she wasn't frail and didn't have mental capacity issues, but she also wasn't available. She also wasn't able to access support through domestic abuse because it wasn't her, her partner or her spouse that was doing it to her. So there is a bit of a loophole for, for people like that. And which route do they go down and how do they seek justice? That's helpful. We move John. Sorry, did you have just, something just to add? Very briefly, just, I think your point and your question is very good. Um, I think the Brackadale review suggests an aggravation on vulnerability anyway, I think. And I think the Scottish Government just closed their consultation on that. But just thinking back to some of the previous Lord Advocate said that you know legislation can affect behaviour. And I think that's a really compelling argument for lots of different things. But actually, this kind of legislation, in whatever way it's enhanced, could be a real statement of intent that this kind of these kind of offences and crimes are absolutely not on. It could be something that's a little bit unique to Scotland by taking that approach, but also has three elements which are quite critical in terms of people coming forward and feeling that they are protected and supported, and not least as they have the confidence that they're going to be taken seriously. We've discuss briefly the kind of the, the barriers that they may have and uh, that they know there's support available to them as part of this that kind of gives prosecutors further tools legal tools at their disposal where they think there might be something lacking and that'll be something for them maybe in a later session but finally acts as a preventative measure as well by enhancing the kind of severity of the crime for those people who are complicit in it that they will actually maybe think twice about doing so and if you draw on the parallels with domestic abuse legislation which rightly was not watered down with anything else, it was right where it is, um, that you can consider um, just the, the enhanced pub publicity of it. You know, I've, you see adverts everywhere about kind of, this is not on, this is what you need to go and do, and this is what will happen to you if you commit these offences. And actually, you could probably, hopefully, we'll see in the future people more reporting, more prosecution, and kind of you know, a lesser extent of the, the crime. So that could be applicable in the same circumstance. Daniel, and this is his line of questioning oh, now. Sorry. No, I mean, it, it's fine and it's useful to, to explore things. I mean, I think actually when we're talking about what changes in the law are needed, I think actually looking at Brackadale explicitly, and I think it's been touched on a number of times, but I'd just like to really ask kind of the panel what their reaction to it. And if I'm sort of just to pull out my reading of what Brackadale recommended, 
One was that, that, that we should consolidate the law around hate crime. Uh, one was that there essentially should be a, a baseline offence and that then the aggravators are used to then uh, you know, protect characteristics. So I was just wondering uh, if the panel could uh, state kind of what their thoughts on that model is. And, and I think then the second and a, a connected point is that, that to what extent that is sufficient, you know, whether or not actually the things that we're talking about really are covered by what we might consider hate crime or whether or not there are other elements of this that we need to be covered off. And just also, just in your answers, I, 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 I think other colleagues want to ask specifically about the, the merits of creating a, a, a standalone statutory offence. So if we could just focus on the, that Brackadale, Brackadale aggravator model uh, and then other colleagues will ask about uh, statutory offences. Well, our preference would be, again, if this, if this is legally possible, for perhaps um, three different models to be, to be working in tandem. Um, we know that hostility on the basis of age happens, but it is very much a minority. Um, so we hear of cases of antisocial behaviour or negative attitudes towards older people because of their age, and it's things like resentment because people think they're claiming more benefits or state support. Now, we don't hear that very much, but I think for the people who do experience it, we would support any proposals uh, for an age-related hate crime. Um, secondly, we believe that a statutory aggravation on the basis of victims being targeted because of their perceived vulnerability could work on top of that. And as I said earlier, if there is a possibility for a specific standalone offence for elder abuse, for the more complicated cases and cases which are clearly involving an older person and all the complicated dynamics that go alongside elder abuse, then we would support that also. Can I just ask you just on that point, because I mean, explicitly Lord Brackadale said that in a sense that, that that's a difficult thing to do because of the, 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 the issues that have been outlined already. Um, and that actually, that in his view, a more broadly stated age uh, aggravator would be, uh, I think, sort of more workable and more useful. I'm just, I'm, I'm just wondering what your response is to that. I think um, any age-related hostility could be on the basis of any age. So it could be resentment towards a, a younger person, for example. So I, I think that approach makes sense. Um, and I'm less aware of um, hostility towards younger adults. Obviously, our experience is older adults, but I think from that point of view, it would definitely make sense for age in its widest category to be the aggravator rather than specifically point, pinpointing old age. Uh, some caveat with uh, Les Mader, they're not a legal expert, but I think the Brackadale review was um, quite neat in that it's obviously looked at how it works across Scotland's um, criminal justice system and, and presumably these, some of these aggravators and aggravations are kind of step up from where we are just now. I think very supportive of a aggravation, the basis of age, and you could see that as something that would work in tandem with you know, fraud and scamming, for instance, whereby you know, the, if it was an older age, you know, the perceived vulnerability, say a scammer has gone after 10 people who are all in their 70s, well, it's not just fraud then, there's a pattern there. But obviously, the same point, the kind of hate crime part could be the case. I mean, you've, seen, you know, you've seen examples of this where um, older people were blamed for the vote to leave the EU and bricks are thrown through older people's windows. Well, that's entirely a hate crime based on age. It's not necessarily just kind of a criminal damage with a, an aggravator. That's a further extreme. I think on the kind of elder abuse things, we could slightly roll back on that. I think they are kind of separate. We're actually looking at the types of crimes that are committed, sometimes over a prolonged period of time that don't necessarily fit neatly into that's just an aggravation. It's just theft and aggravation and crime. They're actually part of it as this kind of prolonged financial, physical, psychological abuse, which has parallels with domestic abuse. But I do think that in terms of the Brackdale Review in general, it was well considered and how it fits into the Scottish criminal justice system. So, so, so just to, to paraphrase, I mean, that, that model of having baseline offences and, 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 and an aggravator on, on top, whether it's hate crime or indeed other common law offences, but in the context of, of an older person, the aggravator then being the, 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 the means of attaching that, that perspective or importance to that crime. Is that, is that roughly what you're saying that we should take away from Brackadale? Sure. And I think part of this goes back to that point about, you know, the, although, sorry, it, it really kind of fits into, that's the sentencing part, isn't it? 
where it comes to the aggravation, whereas actually having prosecutors yeah. thinking about or crimes being reported, it's a sort of different effect, a, diff a different kind of kettle. So really thinking about the kind of the aggravator is really helpful for uh, when sentencing is brought, is it not, as opposed just to that a crime is done. So there's I mean, I think an argument could be made that it would also, in terms of prosecutors and, in, and indeed people investigating crimes, yeah. that it, it, for the similar reasons that you, you, you just talked about in terms of communication, that aggravators can serve that function as well. Um, but Mr. Patterson, I was just wondering if there, you had any thoughts about that, the, the Brackadale model and its usefulness, either with a particular around hate crime or more, or more broadly um, to these issues that we're talking about. Uh, I mean, I think I would first acknowledge a lack of legal expertise in relation to these matters, but I, I, I was attracted to um, the phrase that was in the submission, I think, from Police Scotland or the Law Society, where Lord Brackadale said, age as a category is wider than just including elder. As, as, as this would cover all ages, from, from youth to elderly. Um, I, I, I think it is potentially the case that younger people could be targeted, could be vulnerable, could be exploited. I'm thinking up here about, about county lines and what we're hearing about how young people are being exploited. Sometimes young people who have had adverse childhood events, children who, young adults who've been um, through the care system and, and may have mental health or, or substance misuse challenges. Um, so I, I think any aggravator should probably not be linked to an arbitrary age of 60 or 65, um, but may add value if it was about any age where people have a degree of vulnerability and experience hostility as a result of that. I'll just ask one final question before handing over to, to colleagues. Uh, I mean, I think one of the, the interesting points that's been raised so far is around power of attorney, and it strikes me that that's an area which actually needs some specific focus and perhaps specific changes because of particular things, and, and that would be, I think, stands alone from the point of statutory aggravation. Another point which has been raised with me is around, um, or has uh, come to my attention, is around um, uh, probate. Um, and when somebody is nominated as an executor and they're actually implicated in the abuse or indeed actually the death of the, the individual. It, it strikes me that, that you know, these are two examples of whether you, you know, believe in the merits of a, a statutory offence or aggravators. Actually, these stand alone as areas of law which require focus and attention to, to, to deal with these issues in, as standalone items. I'm just wondering if there are any other areas of the law, such as those, that, that you think might require review to deal with some of the, the particular issues that have arisen in, in, in recent times around the, the wider issue of elder abuse. I would certainly agree power of attorney, and I would probably extend that to a lot of situations where there's a, where there's a family tension, because I think the, the dynamics of those types of harmful behaviour or abuses is much different um, compared to things like doorstep crime and scams. Um, that is an area that I think does merit its a, a, a unique set of circumstances. Um, firstly, because it's difficult for the older person to speak up about it. And secondly, because the, the family dynamics and the associated tension that can cause make it quite a unique issue. Um, I know that in the discussions for the domestic abuse bill, it was recognised that there were certain types of behaviour and also long-term patterns of abuse that weren't easily prosecuted. And I would say that actually the case is very similar in elder abuse um, and that there are types of behaviours that I think would be more easily prosecuted and more easily identified as a, as a separate offence. So to think about the extra offences, but your point about power of attorney, maybe even guardianships might be addressed with adults and capacity act, if you will, um, that might kind of settle that down. But you know, there are big problems there anyway with looking at people on people's own understanding of what their responsibilities are to begin with, or maybe not enough people actually getting power of attorneys done in the first place, either because of their cost, they can, sometimes the complexity, needing, needing a lawyer, and actually explicitly saying what their will is, whether it's for financial or welfare powers. But guardianship orders, is, the guardianship part is also particularly difficult, because these are things which are imposed on the person once they've lost capacity and the person who's been granted the kind of guardianship um, part then is kind of under less scrutiny because the, part of their, the person who's kind of subject to it has never had a, an opportunity to outline how they wish to live their life. So hopefully the Adult and Capacity Bill Act will, will settle that down and find it in due course. But I'm very happy to go away and consider other 
offences which might be treated in the same way. It comes on automatically, Mr. Barson. You don't have to do anything. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I wasn't sure if I was going to be uh, given the opportunity. Uh, I certainly agree, and I agree with Social Work Scotland, who said in their submission that, that they have concerns about um, the misuse of power of attorney, uh, particularly in relation to where an older relative's money has is, is been misappropriated. And I think this is an issue that, that either needs to be addressed through the reform revision of, of some of the provisions of Adults uh, with Incapacity Act, or potentially is, 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 a, is an issue around policy. Um, and I think also I'm, I'm reminded that the Scottish Government consulted fairly recently on a strategy around social isolation. So I think there's probably a policy and uh, strategy response there in relation to some of the issues that colleagues have, have highlighted as leading to or, or uh, um, uh, highlighting the, the vulnerability that some people sometimes have. On to statutory offence, I wonder if I could ask the, camel, uh, the panel to comment on the submission from Social Work Scotland, where they say that elder abuse is not a hate crime I'm motivated from hatred of them. It's more a case that older people are seen as the easy target and intrinsically of less worth than a younger person. And it's that prejudice and this older, less worth that would bring it under the equalities um, kind of banner of a crime that would be aggravated. And if I could also ask um, Leslie Kakari to comment on your lack of data information, how on earth are we ever going to analyse the extent of this problem with Police Scotland and Crown and Procurator Fiscal and other organisations don't record age? Yeah, we certainly find it, it's an ongoing problem. Uh, firstly, in terms of adult support and protection, um, Action on Elder Abuse is a UK-wide charity, and Action on Elder Abuse Scotland is the only one that hasn't been able to produce comprehensive statistics on adult support and protection. We can get really useful local statistics, but because they're collected differently, there's no way of collating it all. Um, secondly, we also submitted Freedom of Information requests to both Police Scotland and the Crown Prosecution Service in 2016. Um, and we're told that they couldn't provide a breakdown um, on age because that information wasn't recorded. Um, so pretty much it's been very difficult for us to get any information on, on the true extent of it, which is why we quite often have to refer to statistics in other parts of the UK as, a, as comparative evidence. I would certainly say that anecdotally, and I know it doesn't hold as much sway as hard statistics, we are hearing it's a, a very similar picture. Um, and I would draw your attention to the statistics we found as part of action on elder abuses research in England and Wales, where we find that of cases that were reported involving criminal cases regarding older people, uh, the majority were not acted upon or resulted in cautions or suspended sentences. Um, we submitted freedom of information requests to all police forces in England. Um, one police force investigated 76 cases of elder abuse, but all 76 resulted in police cautions. Um, another police force didn't re record a single case of elder abuse. We also find that of those that do reach court, very few result in prosecution. We find that the number of successful criminal convictions in 2016 represented just 0.7% of the total prevalence of elder abuse. Um, so obviously that is England and Wales, but we're hearing that the picture is the same and I would very much urge that we need to be better at collecting statistics so that we can gather our own evidence to confirm and corroborate that this is also the case in Scotland. And um, on the prejudice issue? Um, Sorry, could you repeat the That thought? was the prejudice rather than hatred, less worth. Um, so that would follow, uh, as I suppose, under the aggravated offence as being a kind of definition. Definitely. I mean, we, we, we do hear of some cases of hatred or ill will, hostility towards older people, but that is very much the minority. We believe the vast majority of older people are targeted because they're seen as an easy target or seen as being vulnerable. Um, I made the point earlier that a lot of abuse, particularly financial abuse in family situations, is not regarded as criminal by the perpetrator. They think that if it's a family situation, it's OK to do that. So very rarely are the criminal aspects considered. So we really want to send a message to perpetrators that just because you're stealing from your mum doesn't mean it's not criminal. 
Mr. Stutter. It's a really good point um, on the vulnerability part. If you think about it in the future, in you know, the next 20 years, there's going to be half a million more people over the age of 65. The number of people in Scotland living with dementia over the same period of time will increase by 50% to over 120,000. So the, not to use a crass phrase, but the kind of the audience for people uh, looking to, to pick out on vulnerable people is going to get bigger. Um, so it's obviously quite a stark warning uh, in terms of trying to get something right now, um, but it's because they are seen as a soft touch, and obviously it won't be everyone, and not every older person is vulnerable by any stretch of the imagination, but that's why people are targeting them, because it's, a, in a sense, a numbers game. The more people you go after, the more people you might be successful with, but on an elder abuse point of view, they're realising they are a softer touch because of this interdependence, because of this close trusting relationship, and the people's inability to, to see a way out in terms of when they are subject to this abuse. Anything to add, Mr. Parson? Yeah. No, I think I would agree with what colleagues are saying. That, um, and as Social Work Scotland have said in relation to uh, people are not targeted because are, are rarely targeted because they happen to be older. It's because they're potentially seen. I, I would imagine as as an easy target. I think in terms of the, the data issue, I, I, I think it's potentially the case that that the Adult Sport and Protection Strategic Forum that that the Scottish Government convene. Um, which is monitoring progress in relation to the implementation of, of, of the Act 10 years on, should be able to work with the conveners of the, whatever it is, 28, 29 adult protection committees across Scotland to come up with a common data set that is used universally and that reflects um, the sorts of challenges that we're identifying in terms of identifying the age, the types of abuse that, that various people are, are, are experiencing. And that should probably be able to provide a baseline and we can look at how that develops as the years pro pro progress. I think that's helpful. Um, Liam MacArthur. Good morning, uh, panel. I just wanted to start with following up a point um, in response to something you said, Mr Patterson. I think in terms of concerns around the um, power of attorney um, system, the way that it operates and the, the opportunity it provides for abuse, I, I think we'd all acknowledge that. But, but similarly, in, in, in calling for changes, would you accept that we need to take care in not making the system um, uh, unsustainably more complex um, and indeed costly, as it's clearly the case at the moment that, that many seeking for very legitimate um, uh, reasons to, to, um, to, to, to obtain powers of attorney do find that process um, um, sort of comp overly complex uh, and in some places uh, unsustainably costly as well. My experience is fairly limited in this in this regard. I, I am aware that, and, and as Social Work Scotland have highlighted, that there are significant challenges on those very small occasions when concerns are raised about how a power of attorney may be misusing uh, those powers to to take them back to court or to have that power removed or or, 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 or for an intervention to take place. I think, I think the challenge is, is, is best addressed by a heightened awareness campaign, a, a public awareness around the need for us all to get those power of attorneys for our 60th birthday. or you know, And, and the idea that they, they, they become part of what we do in terms of our forward planning. Uh, and the, government's got, the Scottish Government's got a clear role to play in promoting those as a way of ensuring that people are making preparations for the situations that they might encounter in, 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 in later life and are explicit about what their wishes would be in, in those circumstances. Helpful. I, I just want to follow up a, a line of questioning, I think, based on what uh, Ms. Carcary was saying and, and, and that I think that was being pursued by, by Shona Robeson earlier. I mean, obviously, we came into this almost as an issue through the consideration of the domestic abuse bill. I think we accepted at that stage that there was a read across in terms of the types of situations that um, we, were being, we were looking to consider with, as part of that bill, coercive controlling behaviour, patterns of behaviour over a, a prolonged period of time, uh, and abuse of either um, an existing vulnerability, the creation of a vulnerability, um, a, a power dynamic, um, all of which seems to uh, touch on some of what uh, you've been talking about in relation to uh, abuse of, of uh, older people. But I think as we've established this morning, uh, determining the point at which somebody is defined as an older person and, and, and therefore that, um, that this should come into play is, is, is difficult. 
but from the from the experience of the, the domestic abuse bill, is there a is there a model that you would see as as um, transferable to a situation where um, uh, the abuse of a position of responsibility or a position of, uh, of control takes place and therefore could be taken forward uh, it, under criminal proceedings in the way that we've uh, identified and, and, and uh, put in place through the Domestic, domestic Abuse Act? Um, well, well, I see elder abuse and domestic abuse as, as quite different issues. There is some overlap and some crossover, but there are very unique dynamics which are unique to, to both areas. Um, I think actually a model similar to the domestic abuse prosecutions could work well for elder abuse prosecutions. Um, I, I don't believe that elder abuse prosecutions should be prosecuted under domestic abuse. Um, firstly, I think there's a, a sort of society perception that domestic abuse is very much seen as a younger woman's issue. Now, we know it affects men and we know it affects older people as well, but it seems to be very associated with women and the sort of power and control and the, the gender dynamics there, which is why I don't think it would work well for elder abuse to be prosecuted in that way. Um, I think there are merits for a model which is very similar to that, which recognises the very unique dynamics of elder abuse. I'd also suggested in my written submission that the, the process of jury direction and sexual assault cases could be something that could work well for elder abuse. I think a lot of people aren't quite aware of the very unique dynamics and the tensions and the nature of elder abuse. I think it would be very useful to give jury direction to give a better understanding of that. Um, we quite often hear of cases where elder abuse has been reported quite some time after the incident and people will say, well, why are you only reporting it now? Which is also very common to rape cases. And there's an assumption that the person must be lying or that they're just trying to get hold of the older person's inheritance, for example. But actually, we've heard of a few cases. We dealt with a lady a couple of years ago whose father was being abused by the other daughter, the lady's sister. But the lady's sister, who was the abuser, was also psychologically abusing the sister. So the sister was terrified to speak up and the older person was terrified to speak up. And it was only a year after his death that she had the courage to speak up about it. So I think things like that, it would be useful to have jury direction to help explain some of the reasons why people don't speak up or why they speak up later. I think that would be a very useful addition to the system and would raise awareness of the, of the unique dynamics of elder abuse. I mean, I absolutely take your point in relation to um, viewing elder abuse and, and, and domestic abuse very differently. Um, but I suppose one of the other elements of, of, of that recent legislation was um, the, uh, the opportunity not simply to rely on complaints being made by those who had been uh, abused, in a sense, on occasion, processes to be taken out of the hands of the, the, the victim in the interests of public safety and, and, and all the rest of it. Um, again, from what you've been describing about the reluctance of some older people to report abuse, either because they don't recognise it that it's taking place or, or because of the, the, the potential implications for the, the relationships within, within a family setting, is that something that you would see as being necessary in any um, future changes to, to, to legislation in regard to um, elder abuse? Yep, definitely. I mean, um, I, I, I mentioned earlier um, debates around whether if we, we single older people out as a specific group, if that's quite a, an ageist um, policy, but I would argue that the way that we treat victims of domestic abuse is quite unique and quite specific and gives them very specific protection. And I think something similar should be offered to, to victims of, of elder abuse. Um, I take points made earlier that a lot of these issues, um, it's difficult to define the age at which these prosecutions sh should kick in. Um, and I think that's something that, that needs to be considered further. But I, I, I would urge that it is an issue that needs to be seen as a, as a standalone issue, and I would point to cases um, in other countries where it works well. I think I mentioned in my submission that there are certain states in America, uh, most notably San Diego, where they do have a specific offence of elder abuse, where they have very high prosecution rates. Um, and tied in with that, it's not just about prosecutions. Um, the department that deals with that will also offer quite intensive support to older victims going through court. Um, there's also a presumption that they will prosecute. Um, 
they do a lot of awareness raising to the general public and a lot of work to encourage old, older people to speak up about it. Um, I, I would urge you to have a look at that model because I really do think it's something that could work well in Scotland. I'm just fun from my perspective, it's maybe one more for the, the, the panel um, that, that follows on from you, but from your perspective, is there felt to be a gap in the law in bringing forward those sorts of uh, prosecutions at the, at the moment? Um, Say so. Just going back to the earlier point, it's very difficult to get statistical evidence on that. In fact, it's it's impossible. Uh, so anything that that I could add would be anecdotal. Um, I've also pointed in my submission to quite a few media reports. Something we do on a daily basis is look at criminal cases involving older people. Um, we probably write to the media on a daily basis around reports of uh, care workers, for example, being struck off the register, but criminal charges haven't been considered. Um, and it's a message we're always pushing. We just feel that the adult support and protection system and other protective systems in Scotland work very well, but it's the criminal aspect that seems to be missing. Mr Patterson, you said before, I, I think quite rightly, that um, it's not always about criminal prosecutions, which I think we would all um, accept. But are, are you aware of circumstances where um, colleagues of yours m might be persuaded that there are, there are criminal charges that could be brought, and, 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 but that the nature of um, the, the crime that's been committed has proved problematic in taking forward that sort of action? I think that's... That's probably a question better directed towards Police Scotland and, and, and the Fiscal Service. Uh, I, I recognise the distinction between the balance of proof for criminal prosecution and the, and the, and the balance of proof that, that is being considered in relation to um, workers being struck off the SSSC or the NMC's register. And I think that's part of the challenges beyond reasonable doubt versus the balance of probabilities here. Before we leave that, the statutory aggravator, um, in Lord Brackendale's submission, he talks about the um, prosecution f f process failing people whose reliability as a witness might be questioned, for example, vulnerable, frail, um, older people. And it's suggested sometimes that they would be even reluctant to take evidence because it might be too traumatic for these people. In these um, circumstances, this is from the social work um, submission again, they suggest maybe guidance to Crown Procurator Fiscal and Police um, about how best to support these witnesses. And the committee's just um, been looking at stage one of the vulnerable witnesses. We were starting with child witnesses. Would this be something um, that would fall in the category of adult fund witnesses looking at videos, recordings, um, timiously taken, contempor I think contemporarily taken, given that the length of time it can take to get to court means that their health, their mental state may well deteriorate. Could you comment on that? Yep, um, we certainly um, submitted information as, as part of that bill and we would support um, many of the measures that are included there, particularly ones that are currently available to children, we see no reason why they shouldn't be available to, to older witnesses as well. Um, I, I would make the more general point, though, that we can have the best prosecution system in the world and the greatest support ever to encourage people to go through with a court process, but if they don't speak up about it in the first place, then it's a bit of a wasted exercise. Um, we are a very small charity, but we do do our best to raise awareness of elder abuse. But I think that needs to be a concerted effort that we all work together to encourage people to speak up. Otherwise, they're never going to go to court in the first place. I think it helps that if we have a lot of these measures available and let people know that it's there and let them know that there are alternatives to physically speaking in court, it might make them more likely to speak up. So I do think it's a step in the right direction. Yeah, it certainly makes it a lot easier to give evidence. Mr. Sruka. Um, I think that there um, any mechanism that could give comfort to older or more vulnerable witnesses um, is a good move. Um, and I think actually part of this is about culture as well, to for either prosecutors or the police or whoever it is to ensure that they don't think of older people or maybe more vulnerable as any less credible, but take every step they possibly can. And a lot of this can even do with how they communicate with them, whether it's by the type of language they use or regular reporting back on the progress of the case is really important as well. So these older people themselves think there is 
something actually happening. And we've heard a number of occasions from older people about, you know, they might report something and never hear anything again. And again, this is anecdotal. So having that confidence, and as I think Leslie mentioned earlier on about kind of referring back to friends and all the rest of it who might talk about this, they go, was well, there any point in reporting this? Because nothing will ever possible, could possibly happen. And Mr Patterson? Certainly, I agree that um, different ways of supporting people to be witnesses, I think, should be explored. And I, I think video evidence would be one such way. I think also the developments around the appropriate adult scheme, um, the potential that that might be something that could be supported to extend to, 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 to older people who have a degree of frailty or, or, or vulnerability. Um, I, I think in terms, though, I, I received quite late yesterday the, the submission to the committee from the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, but I have to say I was very reassured by the guidance that they already have in relation to how older people as, as witnesses and, and potentially as victims um, should be supported through the processes. So I think that that's already in place, but I think the challenge is if, if they're not reaching that stage, um, that's of limited value, and, and what can we do to support people to reach that stage? Liam Kerr, supplementary, Fulton McGregor. Yeah, briefly, Convener. Leslie Carker, you talked in your response to Liam MacArthur's line of questioning about the successful San Diego model. Um, do they have a definition of elder uh, that we can refer to? They do. Um, I can't remember it offhand. Um, I have it in one of our reports, which I can certainly send in to you. But that would, be useful. would you mind? Uh, yeah. I mean, I know you referenced it there, but do, do they peg to an age as far as you're aware? I can't remember if there's an age. I think there might be. I'll look into it and I can send it to you. I'm very grateful. Fulton McGregor. Hey, thanks, convener, and uh, good morning, panel. I think it's been a, a very uh, interesting session and you've, uh, you've all articulated the views of your respective agencies um, very well. The Law Society of Scotland and, and their um, input to said that human rights compliance does not principally mean prosecuting offences once they have occurred. It means that as far as possible they should not occur. Can I ask the panel to comment? Um, I know you've touched on it in, in, in various parts, particularly yourself, uh, Leslie, but I wonder if you can comment if you think that the current um, system in Scotland, um, both in the prosecution level and the adult support and protection um, framework that's in place, um, meet Scotland's obligations for equalities and human rights? Yep, I totally take the point that obviously it's preferable that, that crime doesn't occur in the first place. But um, unfortunately, because we know that the vast majority of harm and abuse of older people takes place in their own home behind closed doors, um, it's actually very difficult to pick up on that and it makes it very difficult to carry out preventative work. Um, now, I believe that the adult support and protection process in Scotland works very well and is actually the, the envy of the UK because we're the only part of the UK that has dedicated legislation in this area. But with the best will in the world, if someone is not speaking up and if the abuser is carrying out the, the abuse in such a way that it can't be picked up upon, it can be very difficult. Um, we try as much as we can to encourage people to open up and to call our confidential helpline but again, going back to the issue of, of family, as you can imagine, if your grown-up children were doing this, you'd probably be very reluctant to tell anyone. Um, we know that through the Adult Support and Protection Act, various public bodies have a legal duty to report any suspected instances of harm or abuse. So, for example, a GP, um, a, a lot of public sector bodies would need to, they have a legal duty to report that back to the council, but they can't pick up on everything, especially abuse which is taking place behind closed doors. So I think there's a lot more that all agencies need to do to work together to encourage people to speak up. And I think um, Gordon had mentioned earlier the important work that the Scottish Government is doing around the strategy for tackling loneliness and social isolation. Um, I did submit um, information as part of the evidence gathering for that. I had a quick skim through it and I believe there wasn't any mention of the increased risk of harm and abuse from loneliness and I think that's a key factor. I think that is one of the key reasons why people don't speak up because they're so lonely that they're choosing to put up with it. So I think there's a lot that we as a, as a society need to do to tackle the problem of loneliness and social isolation to make it a lot easier for older people to speak up. So, so, so where do you think the system could help with that particular example? Because you gave that example a couple of times, and I think it's really, it's really quite uh, powerful. And I'm sure as MSPs, we've, we've all came across uh, constituency situations where something like that might be happening, where you might have a, you know, a, a relative, uh, as you've mentioned, a, a grown-up child. And so, 
you know, that's perhaps either committing offence knowingly or unknowingly, as, as you've also pointed out. Where do you think that fits into the human rights aspect of, of this? Um, you know, well, you might have a person that's an offence committed against them, but they might also be quite clear that they wouldn't want prosecution. I mean, I know it's a very ethical question to end the, the panel, and I, I apologise for that, but if you get any idea, about, any thoughts on where we could take that? Yeah, it's a very difficult one, and it's one that, that we grapple with all the time. When we do hear from older people who tell us that they're being harmed or abused by their children, we have a confidential helpline, so we would never urge someone to report if they don't want to. The best we can do is tell them about the benefits of reporting and tell them what might happen. Um, but as I said earlier, sometimes we just need to accept that that person is not going to report their, their child or other family member, which is why we would think of other routes such as, well, actually, if loneliness is an issue, maybe we'll refer them to a befriending group, for example. Um, if, for example, it's financial abuse, we might say, well, have you considered perhaps making another trusted person your power of attorney rather than your son? Um, and going back to one of the points raised earlier about power of attorney, it's very difficult for us as an organisation because we need to make people aware of the potential pitfalls of things like power of attorney. But at the same time, we don't want to scare people off because if it's done well, it's actually a very effective safeguard against financial abuse. The problem is that if people leave it too late and then all of a sudden you get the long lost nephew coming out of the woodwork and saying, oh, I can help manage your finances. And because there's no one else in that older person's life, they'll allow them to do that. So it, it's very difficult. And I don't think there is anywhere that we could compel someone to report someone against their will. But I think we need to be looking at various parts of government policy and developments in terms of how can we create a safe space and a space where we can remove some of the barriers so that people can comfortably report and that other people might be able to, to advocate on their behalf where necessary. Thank you so much. I'll just add very quickly that um, I think the, the Scottish Government is absolutely committed to legislation and laws. I think it's putting on the submissions that are fit for the 21st century and the human rights element in this. But thinking about this specific inquiry, into elder abuse, you know, part of the Human Rights Act requires public bodies to act preventatively to protect dignity and human freedom as well. So it'll really be to reflect on, on that, the preventative measures that could be, could be taken and, and, and absolutely taking the point of Leslie, Leslie saying that those people might not want to pursue prosecution, but making sure that there's legislation in place to, to, to ensure that anyone that is prevented from these things happening to them. Okay. That concludes our line of questioning. Can I thank you very much for an excellent um, evidence session, which has given the committee quite a lot to think about. We now suspend to allow for a change of witnesses and a five-minute comfort break.
Yes. Our second panel, um, and I'm delighted to welcome Anthony McGeehan, Head of Policy, Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, Rosalind McTaggart, the Lost Society of Scotland, and Chief Superintendent John McKenzie, Head of Safer Communities, Police Scotland. Can I thank all the witnesses for your written submissions? These are immensely important um, before we come to take formal evidence that um, the members have an opportunity to look at these. I move straight to questions, starting with John Finney. Thank you, uh, convener. Yes, a uh, uh, morning panel. Um, I'm conscious we're all sitting in through the, the, the previous session there, so I, uh, I'll start off with the, the, the same question, but maybe roll the two together, and that is, can you comment on the extent and nature of uh, elder abuse, and is that full range appropriately characterised as being criminal, please? Mr McGeeton? Certainly, I'll start, and, and uh, the Crown Office and Progressive Fiscal Service does, some, does have some relevant statistics in relation to that question. Um, but in answering the question, I would recognise that there is no uniform definition of elder abuse. And also this morning, as well as recognising that lack of uniform definition, the word prosecution has been used, but the word prosecution has been used to describe a variety of different stages of the criminal justice system. And so I'll focus on relevant statistics in relation to those cases that are reported to COPFS, which is obviously different from the cases that may be investigated by the police or other relevant investigating, author investigating authorities or those cases that may not be reported by victims or witnesses to the authorities. So in terms of the cases that are reported to COPFS, the COPFS database was interrogated to examine uh, whether or not there was any relevant data that could be extracted. Um, and with some caveats, uh, COPFS can provide relevant data. The first, the first caveat would be that the COPFS database is an operational database. It's not one maintained for the purposes of statistical um, examination or in gathering of uh, relevant data. Um, and it's also in part dependent upon information received by reporting agencies. But witnesses within cases reported to COPFS, um, the information that's provided in relation to those witnesses does include the age of e each witness or victim, um, and reporting agencies do identify individual witnesses within reported cases as victims. So with those caveats, the information available um, is that when we look at uh, reported cases to COPFS between April 2016 and December 2018, approximately 400 uh, to 550 victims aged over 60 are reported to COPFS each year. And we can break down the profile of the principal charges in those cases. And that breakdown would be as follows. 28% of those uh, reported cases relate to principally charges of violence. 25% relate to principal charges of sexual offences. 22% relate to charges which might be described as abusive behaviour and 5% relate to charges that might be described as dishonesty. An interesting feature of those cases is that over 60% of the victims aged 60 or over are recorded as having been involved in a domestic abuse incident and in individual years that percentage rises to 69%. So what we see is that within that profile of, of reported offending, which might qualify as elder abuse, a significant proportion of that offending um, occurs within a domestic abuse context. And if I may, for the avoidance doubt, um, and everything hinges on definitions, I accept, you, you mean domestic abuse in the terms that we would all readily understand in this, this room? Indeed. Thank you. Mr McKenzie. Um, in addition to the, the, the submission by the Crown, I suppose I go back to the point that you've highlighted already. Police Scotland do not hold statistics in relation to the term elder abuse because we've heard already today the term elder abuse has no definition from a, from a legal perspective within Scotland. Um, however, um, I anticipate that, um, and we've heard points of not recording witness ages, victims' ages. Well, actually, Witness ages are recorded within uh, Police Scotland systems. However, the, the challenge would be the searchable component of that. Um, 
So I don't have statistics to demonstrate the age range of offences, and whether that would be helpful or useful for this discussion is questionable based on the subject matter of elder abuse and that definition around elder abuse. However, what I would highlight is that the submissions that have been made in relation to under-reporting of abuse based on age or age hostility or vulnerability, I'm quite confident to say that there's a significant under-reporting of such criminal acts. Um, and I base that on a number of factors, including uh, the factor around research around hate crime in its general sense, whereby hate crime itself is anticipated to be underreported by up to about 80 per cent. So actually, the, the figure in terms of how widespread is the, the challenge that we face in terms of the term elder abuse or abuse target or criminal acts targeting individuals who are vulnerable due to age or hostility towards age, I am clear that there is a significant under-reporting. Um, and I would also go back to, for a variety of reasons, which I'm sure we will explore, and I would also go back to the point of there probably is a requirement to look further th at the analytical opportunities that we have to try and define what the size of the challenge is as we go forward. But I don't have anything that will bring, uh, from a statistical perspective, that will bring any additional information to this panel at this moment in time. Thank you. Are you able to give some background to who reports that abuse to you? You'll be recipients of reports and allegations from the care inspectorate. Um, who else would make? Are there any other statutory bodies that would make complaints of that nature to you as well as individuals? Well, it's clear that, and I think it's helpful that the Crown Office have highlighted sort of four categories of abuse that they would classify, or areas in which would be classified as abuse or neglect. Uh, from an age perspective. Obviously, family members and victims themselves will report, but in terms of uh, agencies, care commission, uh, local authorities, uh, care institutions, there's a wide variety of institutions that uh, would report to the police. And there would be a, a robust investigation into the circumstances around, um, around the circumstances. Um, and I suppose it's interesting that um, one of the panel members was asked a question around um, the difference between people getting removed from positions. I suppose there is a difference between a criminal allegation and a procedural allegation in relation to work-related uh, practices. Um, but there are a wide range of um, bodies that would report such uh, incidents to the police. And are you in a position to say, acknowledging the statistical challenge there might be there, or do you have a, a, a gut sense as to the percentage of these reports that are made to Police Scotland would result in reports to the, the, the Crown? I don't have a, a percentage that I could give that would be helpful at this moment in time. I'm quite content to go back and have a, a look to determine whether we could look at that percentage, but I'm not confident that I'd be able to provide that, those details. But I will certainly go back and report back, as I have previously to this committee in writing. Okay, thank you. I don't know if, Ms McTaggart, you have um, any general comments of... on that? Who, who's reporting um, these offences as solicitors, we would tend to represent the accused, not the witnesses. So I would defer to, to both the Crown and the police in relation to who would report it and the statistics in relation to that. OK, thank you very much. Yep. Jenny. And good morning to the panel. Um, in the previous evidence session, we heard from Action on Elder Abuse, and I note in their written submission, they point to statistics from England and Wales with regard to the number of successful convictions in 2015-16, which was about 0.7% of what they thought was the total uh, prevalence of, of elder abuse. And we also heard from them in the oral session that um, of a case whereby a, a victim had had to badger police to be taken seriously. And I wonder, therefore, is there a cultural challenge in terms of uh, elder abuse being part of some sort of hierarchy whereby it's not seen taken can, I suppose, as seriously as, as other crimes might be. From the TOPFS perspective, um, since 2013, we have a published policy in relation to crimes involving elder persons, um, and that policy makes clear the robust approach taken by COPFS to these types of crimes, and it specifies a presumption in relation to prosecutorial action where there's a sufficiency of evidence. Um, and I think that, that uh, the lack of... Um, uh, relevant statistics should not be read as um, reflecting a lack of a robust approach to these types of offending or offences. From a police perspective, um, I've highlighted previously to uh, at various stages that policing has changed dramatically over the years from uh, what was traditional sort of Pelian principles, 
whereby at this moment in time in excess of 70 per cent of calls relate to that of vulnerability. Police Scotland have invested significantly in training and our approach to deal with um, incidents whereby we are primarily dealing with issues of vulnerability. It is always disappointing to, to hear cases highlighted by uh, other parties of um, an insufficient service, and I believe the term badgering police was used uh, during the evidence session. I am unable to, to make comment on that specific case because I am unclear what the, the details are, but it is always disappointing to hear that. However, in terms of is, it, is there a hierarchical system in terms of importance, absolutely not. It is clear that we, um, that we prioritise vulnerability in the community. Our aim is to ensure that we carry out robust and professional investigations to all reports of criminal acts. And, um, so, but there will be occasions, I anticipate, uh, across all of policing, whereby singular incidents could be highlighted about a poor service, which is always disappointing. And I would intend to go and, and discuss this with a uh, with colleague to see if I can provide some additional uh, sort of guidance or, con or get some context around that. But there is certainly not a lack of priority in terms of dealing with individuals who are vulnerable within the community of Scotland. In terms of that wider support, I mean, uh, the Police Scotland written submission points to uh, protecting elderly people from exploitation, including building partnerships with staff and other agencies such as banks, post offices, uh, local authority, consumer and trading standards departments. And I wonder, therefore, what the police currently do in terms of that support. Is it about signposting to the appropriate advice services uh, if they have been a victim, or is it about reaching out to them, you know, more proactively? I think it's both in as much as there has been there have been numerous successful campaigns of late in which we have worked in partnership with uh, national banking institutions, uh, other agencies in relation to identifying issues, especially around areas whereby there is uh, financial abuse. Um, and there, so there, there's a signposting component. But in terms of the proactive comp uh, component, um, that works through our community-based officers who work in communities who, if they have uh, interaction with individuals who they believe to be vulnerable due to age or whatever vulnerability, then they will take proactive measures to provide advice, guidance or in engage with wider family members to provide that advice and guidance. Um, I wonder if I could pick up, Mr McGeekin, on your um, point that uh, there's a robust um, prosecution of this type of abuse with a sufficiency of evidence. Social work um, have said in their, or pointed out in their um, submission, that the legal system has challenges in providing protection and justice um, where the current investigation and prosecution process fail people whose reliability of witness as a witness may be questioned. For example, vulnerable and frail older people, it might be looked at as too stressful for them or because they've got dementia or they're older, then um, there isn't the same, um, the same, I suppose, the same amount of evidence gathered. If that's the case, would it be good to look at perhaps the vulnerable witnesses, the adult um, vulnerable adults is something that is in the next tranche um, envisaged under the, the Act, should it be passed? And would that be particularly helpful given if it's deteriorating mental health, the length of time it can, help, it can take for um, these cases to come to court to ensure that you get the very best evidence as soon as possible, including um, prior statements and video recordings? Um, well, at present, as outlined in our submission, um, all witnesses aged over 60 are referred to our Victim Information and Advice Service. Um, and uh, we recognise that all, not all witnesses aged over 60 uh, will require uh, special measures, as indicated by the earlier panel. Uh, there is no magic age at which a person becomes vulnerable. Our Victim Information and Advice Service it will currently engage with the witness in relation to those special measures which are currently available, which include evidence by commission, which is the principal focus of the bill currently going through the Parliament in relation to uh, vulnerable witnesses. So, at present, the menu um, of support that may be available to a witness dependent upon their particular vulnerability includes screens, a TV link, the presence of a supporter, the use of a prior statement, as you've already identified, um, or evidence by commissioner. The different approach taken by uh, the 
Uh, vulnerable Witnesses to Criminal Evidence Scotland Bill is in relation to the default position for witnesses, uh, dependent upon at present uh, their, that their status as a child. The Bill contains a power to roll that out to deemed adult vulnerable witnesses in relation to particular categories of offence. Um, so the scope exists at present for the use of a prior statement as described by Social Work Scotland. The, the scope exists at present for a vulnerable adult witness to give evidence by way of commissioner. It would obviously be a matter for the Parliament as to whether or not they would wish to roll that out further um, in the context of the Bill. So you would dispute that there's, there's any kind of reluctance or um, there hasn't been as a robust uh, an approach to this because it just might be too stressful or because the person has dementia or because there is some question about their reliability to actually using the special measures in place just now and the ones that could be available under the Vulnerable Witnesses Act? I, I, I would recognise that there are particular challenges, particular evidential challenges in relation to the categories of offences or the type of offending that we're speaking about, but I would rebut any suggestion that prosecutors do not actively look for the types of support that might be best suited to the individual witness, their status and any vulnerability that they have, including issues such as dementia. Okay, thank you. Daniel Johnson. So I'd just like to sort of, in a sense, repeat my line of questioning to the, the first panel. I mean, uh, although I, I, mean, I think I'll, I'll slightly change the, the, the tack on it, because I, I mean, I understand that, 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 that largely all three of the organisations that you're representing favour um, something along the lines of the Brackadale model with uh, aggravators. But just following on from the, the discussion in the previous panel about the potential limitations, you know, so first of all, that, that, that a lot of these issues aren't necessarily motivated per se by hate, um, and that, that, that may be a, just essentially circumstance. Can I ask whether or not an aggravator around vulnerability would sufficiently capture those uh, things, and in particular, some of the elements that were discussed around the, the uh, kind of what might be in terms of borrowing the, 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 the concepts from the Domestic Abuse um, Act around coercive and controlling behaviour, but within this context, would that aggravator model capture those things and and if so how from a legislative perspective would you uh, think that that, that 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 could be brought about if you were pursuing that, that ag uh, the, the Brackadale model in answering that question I would reference Lord Brackadale's assessment so um, parallels have been drawn with domestic abuse uh, and the most recent evolution of our approach to domestic abuse um, in relation to coercive or controlling behaviour. Um, COPFS cannot provide any evidence in relation to um, offences involving that type of behaviour and would reference Lord Brackadale's report at paragraph 4.65 uh, where um, his conclusion was that based on the evidence and arguments which he had heard, he did not think there was any real gap in relation to patterns of conduct against the elderly which ought to be criminal or, but are not. And that then took Lord Brackadale on to propose a model uh, based upon statutory aggravations. And there were two separate aggravations proposed, one in relation to age and one in relation to vulnerability. And that is an approach that COPFS is familiar with and would recognise in terms of the types of offending that we are dealing with on a daily basis. I mean, just before I, I ask Rosalind McTaggart the same point, I mean, are, are there any particular considerations in terms of framing those aggravators that you feel might be necessary in order to, to fully capture the issues that have been discussed so far this morning? Well, the earlier panel recognised the difficulty of identifying a, 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 a particular age that might qualify um, for any age aggravator, and Lord Brackadale proposed an aggravator simply based upon age as opposed to defining an age for older persons. Um, and similarly be challenges in relation to defining vulnerability um, or perceived vulnerability and what might qualify as a vulnerability, perceived vulnerability, whether that was on the basis of age or uh, I think um, has already been mentioned in this morning's um, discussion, a vulnerability, for example, based upon either a real or perceived learning disability. Rosa McTaggart. Thank you. Questions. In terms of assessing whether the, the current legislation or proposed legislation can indeed capture 
all the areas we're seeking to protect. Certainly, we should mention the, the 2018 Act and whether we now take time to ascertain the effectiveness of that in allowing protection in domestic or intimate relationships and those settings. The reason we're having this evidence session is because we're all concerned there remains a gap and how best to fulfil that and to provide protections. The age aggravation allows for an equal protection for people of all ages, and that is indeed supported by the Law Society of Scotland. And thereafter, within our written submissions, we suggest perhaps other potential areas that might cover any gap, should that be left behind by the current proposed changes. Um, in terms of vulnerability um, and an aggravation in relation to covering exploitation and vulnerability that may indeed provide a route um, to cover any areas left behind. Or indeed, you'll note within our submissions, um, we refer to further potential coverage um, being taken up um, on a route similar to protection of young persons, um, the Children and Young Persons Scotland Act 1937, um, as a, a backstop really in terms of allowing a, a full um, sufficiency and protection of those affected by vulnerabilities such as those we've been discussing this morning. Uh, Chief Superintendent Mackenzie, I, I, I wonder if I could ask you the question in a slightly different way. And I think in the previous panel, I think we heard that the, it, it can sometimes be a bit of a blurry line just given the circumstances. We're talking about complicated family relationships and where uh, essentially you know, something stops being simply dysfunctional and, and relationship breakdown and tips over into uh, something that should perhaps be criminal um, is clearly, I think, kind of what, what we're focused on. Uh, I mean, is there a sense in which the police would find it useful to, ha to have a clearer threshold and, and does going down the, the route of aggravators help clarify um, what is criminal and, and what is simply kind of... Uh, um, D dysfunctional. Uh, so again, I'm not going to repeat the quotes that I've highlighted from Brackdale earlier on by um, my colleague from Crown Office. Uh, uh, so I suppose going back to your earlier question that existed in the earlier panel, you talked about a baseline offence and then the, thereafter the aggravators. So let me just touch on Brackdale himself in as much as paragraphs 4.66 and 4.70 refer to the merits of both the recommendations 10 and 11 about the age hostility and actually why age hostility does not capture um, the challenge that is trying to be achieved here and as much as trying to protect individuals who are vulnerable and <clears throat> that, that aspect of not defining age under the term age hostility so not trying to place an arbitrary age on that so and then Police Scotland have also highlighted, well, actually, we then support the view of having an aggravator that looks at wider vulnerability. Now, that is the aggravator that I believe in my professional judgment is more beneficial because then it allows us to make a decision on not the threshold that you've talked about, but actually what is motivating the criminal act that's been presented. So even within a family setting, you would you would be required to have a baseline offence, which is then aggravated as a result of the vulnerability of the individual within the family setting. And I suppose I then go back to uh, the point, I just want to make a point just based on your one of the final questions that you'd highlighted in the last evidence session about that bit about human rights in as much as police being able to make a judgment within a family setting of whether it's in that person's human rights to actually uh, progress a criminal investigation, whether that individual does not want to be progressed or not. Well, actually, that in my mind doesn't come into a threshold scenario. Actually, we have a duty uh, to ensure that we prevent wider criminality, that we look at protecting the individual concerned and wider society. And if that ultimately means then progressing an investigation without the support of the victim, I, and I accept that that then has difficulties when we get to any future stage, but in the stage one investigation, that does not prevent that stage one investigation taking place. Thank you. So again, just, just finally, and again, repeating a little bit what I asked the, the previous panel, I, mean, I think we heard that there is perhaps a case uh, to look at probate and whether or not we need some additional safeguards to prevent 
um, that being abused. I mean, likewise, uh, you know, I think where an individual is found guilty of, of uh, culpability in someone's death, in particular a murder, whether or not they should be able to be an executor of that person's will, I think is another question where we're, I think there are clear pinpoint areas of law where perhaps some of these issues do require some specific changes. I'm just wondering if the panel would agree whether the, there are, you know, those areas in particular are, are ones that need looked at, and indeed whether or not there are other uh, specific areas of law which, with the benefit of this perspective, could uh, look at review beyond the, the question of whether or not there should be a specific offence or, or, or an aggravator. Um, I'd be interested in any of the panellists' views on that. Who'd like to take that? Mr McGee. <laughs> As a prosecutor, I cannot comment on law in relation to probate, for example. Um, and again, as a prosecutor, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to, con to, compl sorry, to comment on the consequences of a criminal conviction in relation to, for example, uh, the accused's uh, status um, as an executor. Um, and again, uh, beyond the, the improvements proposed by Lord Brackadale, um, I can't identify any additional improvements um, in relation to the prosecution of these offences, um, as distinct from perhaps the focus of your question, which is the wider context of, of, of um, the consequences of abuse. I, I, I recognise they're sort of maybe not quite within the scope of the CFO, so I, I do wonder whether or not the Law Society might have a view on, on those issues in particular. Certainly there would appear issues that were discussed in the first session this morning and issues raised by yourself of people being a power, um, a power of attorney or indeed um, guardianship orders. There's significant issues in terms of um, the elderly person and their incapacity, perhaps uh, an area requiring more education in relation to the powers being granted at the point of power of attorney. Um, thinking of the submissions this morning, by Ms Carkery in relation to perhaps anecdotal evidence of, of powers being granted to children who may be causing harm to their parent and the, the, the emotional um, perhaps manipulation there or, or naivety of, of those granting those powers of attorney that, that do afford a significant level of power once granted. Um, certainly there may well be an area that that would require further education um, and outreach in relation to those vulnerable groups, hopefully to reach them in advance of such powers being granted. I suppose, in the, from a police scotland perspective, on the same basis that Mr Norigi has highlighted, it's inappropriate for him to make further comment. It's inappropriate for police scotland to make further comment on the questions you've posed. Understandable. Um, supplementary, Liam Kerr. Thank you. Yeah, very briefly, uh, Rosalind McTaggart, uh, you earlier said to Daniel Johnson that we might need to take time to ascertain the impact of the domestic abuse legislation. Uh, and that's something that's developed through the submission that was put in earlier. Uh, I just wonder if you might develop that for my full understanding. It, 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 is it your understanding that someone or some agency is proactively assessing the outcomes derived directly from the domestic abu abuse legislation? If so, what data are they capturing, capturing and when will that report? Indeed, um, I would certainly hope that the, the, the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service might monitor the effectiveness of prosecution in terms of the new legislation and indeed capture data that would allow the effectiveness of new legislation to be ascertained. Okay, so just as far as you're aware, though, that would be the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal are the only ones looking at the outcomes uh, of this. Just, it's just because you mentioned it throughout your submission uh, as being quite a crucial thing to know the outcomes. Um, and I'm just wanting to know who is doing that. Absolutely. I would certainly hope that it would be the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. I wouldn't be able to point you to any other agency who would be collating that data. All right. Uh, Mr McGeehan, would you like to comment on that? Um, the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service currently records data in connection with domestic abuse offences and will continue to record data in connection with the instance and outcome of domestic abuse cases. Um, you used the word effectiveness, and I think my colleague used the word effectiveness. Um, it, COPFS uh, would, would provide that information, but perhaps for others to judge um, what is meant by effectiveness and whether or not uh, the Act meets those particular uh, definitions. Yeah. Supplementary, Rona, followed by Liam MacArthur and uh, then Fulton. Thank, thank you, Convener. Good, good morning. Um, I just wonder, if, is it possible for you to say um, 
what impact in sentencing an aggravator or even a, a standalone offence would have were it to be introduced? Um, it depends upon the, the framework within which the statutory aggravator is set, but a common framework is um, to require uh, the court to uh, take the aggravation into account um, and if it does not, to articulate why it does not think that the aggravator is relevant for the purposes of sentencing. Um, courts can currently take into account um, aggravating factors in relation to crimes against elderly persons, including their vulnerability and the exploitation of that vulnerability. Um, but one of the advantages of a statutory aggravator is, is that it can create a framework for that consideration by the court. And it would depend, presumably, on the individual case, what this the impact on the sentence that that would have, I guess, yeah. Yes. Is that your understanding, um, Ms McTaggart? Indeed, in providing a disposal for any offence, um, once um, having pled guilty or being found guilty after trial, that person sentencing the accused, be it a justice of the peace, a sheriff or a judge, they ought to take into account the relevant facts and circumstances of both the offence and the offender. And indeed, um, within our submissions, we reference um, a judge providing direct reference to the age of a vulnerable person and indeed the length of time they spent in their home, which adds to certainly the, the emotive nature and the vulnerability that the judge seems to be taking into account when disposing of the matter. But at the moment, it, there's not a, a statutory aggravator, but it, it's happening. You, do you feel that the introduction of one would make it clearer uh, or more effective? Um, a way for prosecution? Um, perhaps while it's not quite an area for me to comment, I would certainly say that our judiciary will take into account all relevant facts and circumstances and whether there is a statutory aggravator in relation to the offence, I would expect um, the person providing outcome for any offence to truly take into account all of those circumstances, including vulnerabilities of those involved. Okay, Thank you. Um, I would probably refer to the Crown Office submission on page four, the second paragraph, which outlines my understanding of the expectation of an aggravator from a Crown, uh, from a, a court's perspective, in which that aggravator would then be required to be considered, unless there is a rational why, a rational why not. Um, but beyond the submission by the Crown, um, the expectation of an aggravator is highlighted within page four is highlighted. Thank you, Lee McArthur. Thank you. Just following up the line of questioning from um, Daniel Johnson and, and Liam Kerr, obviously um, the Brackadale report has, has set the, ag the statutory aggravator in the context of wider hate crime, both in relation to um, age but also in terms of vulnerability. I, I think thinking back to um, where the committee first um, uh, sort of addressed this issue in the context of at that stage of the domestic abuse bill, we were told at that point that while um, much of what's covered was already criminal, the aspect in relation to coercive and controlling behaviour, the pattern of behaviour, as opposed to um, a, a sort of point in time incidents, uh, wasn't adequately covered. Now, I think we were um, told about the, the differences between um, elder abuse and domestic abuse. There's obviously a, an overlap where that abuse takes place uh, between partners or, or, or ex-partners, but there's a large swathe that wouldn't be covered uh, by that. So it strikes me if there was a if there was a gap in the law prior to that act in relation to domestic abuse covering coercive controlling behaviour and patterns behaviour over a over a period. Is the same not true in terms of um, dealing with with, with issues of um, criminal behaviour um, in, a, in relation to, to, to older people, will that vulnerability is being exploited um, where the, the, the age dimension comes into to play. I mean, it seems to be self-evident that um, if, the, if the inadequacies uh, or the insufficiencies in the, in the way the criminal law was set up in relation to domestic abuse prior to that um, act being passed, then presumably there must still then be um, an insufficiency um, or, or a gap in the in, in the criminal law in relation to, to elder abuse. Um, in terms of looking at the the gap that perhaps lies in coercive conduct, as as you've termed it, um, it, it may be that 
the gap left behind by the new bill is, is not one of age, but of um, the nature of the relationship. The current restriction is that of a domestic or intimate relationship. We've heard evidence that the gap left behind is that the perpetrators are family members um, with whom they're not in an intimate relationship. Um, so that may well be the gap rather than one of age. However, it's an area requiring further investigation and development. I absolutely appreciate that, and I think we were told um, the reasons why you need to consider these separately, albeit that there is that there is an overlap um, in, in relation to, to those intimate relationships. But if, if the criminal law has struggled to deal with the, the, the issue of coercive controlling behaviour and then patterns of behaviour over a period, then that would, would seem to apply in relation to less intimate but still perhaps in a family setting relationships where um, uh, where, where positions of, of power or authority are being are being abused, would it not? I mean, I can understand why you would maybe want to take time to see the way in which the, 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 the most recent um, legislation in relation to domestic abuse um, impacts and, and, and the effect that it has, um, but that would tend to almost confirm that there remains a gap. It's, it's just that <coughs> pardon me, we're, we're taking time to assess how best to address it. <coughs> Indeed, in referencing some of the findings of, of Lord Brackdale, there requires to be um, some time and consideration given to statistics and whether there, there does remain a, a gap and um, behaviour that is not criminalised as yet. It may well be that there is not behaviour um, left behind to criminalise that is not caught by legislation we have presently. Um, there is obviously now the, the bill that would relate to this psychological and um, coercive behaviour that would affect domestic relationships, and indeed that would appear to capture um, a lot of crimes, a high percentage of crimes involving elderly people. Um, the position for the Law Society would be that we'd require to ascertain the, the effectiveness of the legislation as it currently stands and to thereafter assess whether there's any gaps. We'll get back into the debate about the effectiveness or how that is judged. I, I was just wondering whether there is an additional um, complication in this and that, again, as we were hearing um, f from each of the panellists in the, in the first panel, um, the reluctance very often of individual vi victims to come forward, either because they don't recognise the abuse as abuse, given the, the, the relationship, or a concern about the implications for the breakdown of that relationship, were they to come forward with a complaint. Does that, I mean, presumably that um, makes um, it more difficult, um, sensitive, complex to, to take forward um, uh, any sort of, of, of complaint. Um, but is that is that something that is being looked at in, in particular? That can that be assessed separate from the analysis of how the latest domestic abuse um, act is is impacting? In assessing the the difficulties of perhaps reporting, I think would refer to the the need for greater support, um, signposting um, support of these vulnerable groups to assist them, to make them aware of various options open to them in terms of reporting support networks, agencies, um, and perhaps education in relation to the role both of the police and of the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service may well assist in terms of the level of reporting. But again, that might be an area better um, answered by those for the Crown and for the police. I mean, in terms of the police, where, the, where there is a, an unwillingness uh, on the part of, of um, a, a victim either to recognise that a, a crime has taken place or, or a, an unwillingness to, to, to make a complaint because of the potential implications. I mean, how, how are the police addressing that sort of situation at the, at the present time? Well, I would probably use the same uh, sort of parameters as you would use within a domestic abuse setting, whereby the issue of the psychological coercive controlling behaviour is such that an individual may not be aware <coughs> that they are a victim of domestic abuse and by extension if you're using the term elder abuse in, in its widest sense may not be, a, 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 be aware uh, of being a victim of elder abuse and to secure an investigation the decision making process around whether a complaint is made or not 
is removed from the victim. So actually, the position here is if there's any source of information to indicate that somebody is a victim of an abusive act, criminal act, neglectful act, whether it's through age or whatever wider vulnerability, then actually <clears throat> the police do not need to await for that individual to come forward and provide a statement of complaint. As we do within a domestic abuse environment, um, the guidance is clear that actually that decision-making process uh, can be taken away from the victim for the benefit of the victim and for um, the purposes of the investigation. Now, that then generates challenges uh, and for any further prosecution uh, process. However, it allows us to undertake an investigation. It allows us to engage with wider partners to ensure that wider support mechanisms are in place. So we've talked about social work earlier on and uh, we've talked about adults at risk, whereby that type of investigation wouldn't be done in isolation by the police service. There would be a multi-agency response to so that we can then ensure that there's wider support mechanisms. So that actually, if the criminal investigation is not founded, actually the support mechanisms will still be put in place. So in terms of your core question of how is that then dealt with, actually the decision is taken away from the victim if the victim doesn't wish to come forward. And actually we have a, a sort of evid an evidential case that, the, that somebody has been neglected. From the evidence we were getting during the consideration of the Domestic Abuse Bill, that that, that, that process, that approach was novel um, to that bill. But from what you've described, that is an approach that Police Scotland takes, presumably not just in, in relation to domestic abuse or, or I suspected elder abuse cases, that, that actually there is an opportunity for the police to make a, a judgment on the basis of the evidence presented to them, whether or not to, uh, to, to, to undertake a, a more detailed investigation. The questions could be a little yeah. bit shorter, please, than the responses. Um. So, so I, I would highlight that for a variety of crimes. So I take hate crime as an example because of... So actually, I, I recognise that hate crime is underreported. I've highlighted that I believe hate crime to be underreported by some studies that suggest 80%. However, that doesn't negate the opportunity of a witness to, to come forward who is not the primary victim to highlight that hate crime has taken place. Would Police Scotland investigate it? Of course we would investigate it. And likewise, if somebody came forward who was not the victim of a neglectful act, would Police Scotland investigate it? Yes, we would. Okay. And Fulton McGregor. Uh, thanks, Convener. At the um, end of the last panel, I asked about um, the, the panel's thoughts on how Scotland was meeting its human rights and equalities uh, obligations in this area. And I'm, go I'm going to ask the same again. I, in the last panel, I, I quoted the Law Society. I'll, I'll <laughs> I, I, I won't do that, but you will have heard the, the discussions that took place uh, at the end of the, uh, the, the, the last panel and um, the, the grappling that's going on between um, sometimes quite difficult and complex situations whereby um, you know, a, perhaps a, an offence has been committed against an individual, but it might be tied in a, a, you know, a close um, family connection and perhaps the offence, the offender or the per perpetrator, sorry, not realising they've committed an offence. Uh, have the panel got any thoughts on, on you know, how, how the current uh, legislation and, and frameworks can help promote equalities in human rights? Any order? Part of that, help promote? Uh, the equalities in human rights in this particular area. Our, our obligations to equalities in human rights. I'm afraid I, I can't comment on uh, the state's compliance with ECHR in relation to this particular field. I can only provide a perspective in relation yep. to the, 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 the prosecutorial approach. Ms. McTaggart. Um, and I think, in terms of from a criminal law aspect, looking at um, the protection of human rights as our um, submissions reflect, um, does not necessarily mean prosecuting offences once they have occurred. It's far better to prevent those offences occurring in the first place and that's where we would relate back to training, education and perhaps multi-agency support provided in the community. So how do you think, have you got any views on how that can be done through the, the, the current um, system that's in place, perhaps through the adult support and protection procedures? I wouldn't have any comments on that at this time but certainly I could ask if the Law Society might be able to provide a further response in writing. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I suppose I refer back to uh, a 
colleague who provided evidence earlier on about uh, the wider uh, articles within human rights in relation to that aspect about prevention. Um, and I suppose it touches on the question of uh, that's been uh, raised already by Mr McArthur in relation to our approach when uh, a victim does not wish to, to report a, a criminal act. Um, I have no real wider comment to make other than to say, um, you know, in terms of the police activity, our ethics and values will be enshrined within uh, ECHR principles. Um, but in terms of this subject matter that you've raised under this specific uh, question, I, I don't have any further points to make at this moment in time. Okay, thanks a lot. In, in relation to the adult support protection aspect, that was um, discussed in the, um, the, the the previous panel and the, the police role in that. I think that uh, one of our uh, witnesses talked about it being a, a multi-agency approach. Um, is there any, any thoughts on that and how, how, how the police kind of see their view within that within that framework? The um, the reference to the multi-agency approach is, has got synergies with the child protection approach in as much as it's a multi-agency approach uh, in which there is an expectation for agencies beyond the parameters of the police to be involved. So people talk about a tripartite approach from a child protection perspective in which health and social care, health and, and police would be involved in a, a wider discussion, but that doesn't mean it's, it's constrained by that, those parameters. There might be wider persons involved in those discussions. And the same from an adult protection perspective, there's an expectation that there would be, and the term IRD has probably been used before within this committee, that, that position of having an IRD in which various agencies um, bring information, relevant information, to the matter at hand. And then that goes back to the point I've made earlier on, that actually the role of the police is beyond that of the criminal investigation. The role of the police, as highlighted about the vulnerability component, enters into the element of support, protection, prevention. So actually, we cannot do that as a standalone agency. We have to recognise that health and social care partnerships, wider agencies have a role to play. So my expectation would be that across Scotland, it's not my expectation, it's, it's a matter of, well, yeah, my expectation is that across Scotland, um, agencies would be involved on a multi-agency basis to protect adults at risk across our communities. Thanks very much for that answer. I think it was helpful to get on record. Thanks. Just one final question. Uh, Action for Elder Abuse Scotland submitted a Freedom of Information request to both Police Scotland and the Crown Ochre and Procurator Fiscal in 2016. And a response from both highlighted that neither agency records the age of the victim and that made it very difficult to gather data on criminal cases involving older people or to analyse this, the true extent of criminal prosecutions regarding older people in Scotland. Can um, Police Scotland and COP confirm if that's still the case? I'm happy, I'm happy to speak from the uh, COPFS perspective in that regard. I'm afraid that the evidence in relation to the FOI request was inaccurate. Um, I've recovered the FOI request in question, and it illustrates some of the challenges that uh, the committee has heard and explored um, over the course of this morning's session. Um, so the FOI request uh, was not in relation to the ages of the victims. COPFS and Police Scotland does record the age, as I've said, of all victims and witnesses um, that are um, listed in police reports received by COPFS. But the FOI request that was received in 2016 was um, asking a very broad question and a series of subsidiary questions. But the very broad questions that were asked uh, were how many reports were submitted to COPFS by the police in which the harm, neglect or abuse of an older person was a feature and echoing this morning's discussion, there was no definition of older person eh, and there was no definition with reference to the criminal law in relation to offences involving harm, neglect or abuse of an older person. The COPFS response to that FOI request was not that the information was not held, but rather that in order to obtain the information as currently asked for or as then asked for in its broadest sense, would require manual interrogation of individual reports and that manual interrogation was beyond the limit set by the FOI Act. Um, so I'm afraid that... Anywhere in recording the age of the victim, that's the, the question. No. Um, no all, all police reports received by COPFS record the age of every witness in a case, including 
that of a victim. And that's available? Um, it is available. I've already indicated um, that we can interrogate the database in relation to the ages of persons listed in cases um, and identified as a victim. So is there um, a concerted effort now to always make sure that that uh, effort isn't av available to analyse the extent of the problem? Uh, well, again, we would need some certainty in relation to what definitions uh, are being applied and what information has been requested. But as indicated in the COPFS written submission, information is available with appropriate caveats in relation to the ages of persons reported to COPFS and identified as victims. I think it would be helpful to see the FOI and the response, um, sure. and if that could be provided, that would be helpful. And Mr Mackenzie? Um, as highlighted earlier on, um, witnesses and victims' ages are recorded. Um, I was unclear of the parameters of the FOI, however, if that's the parameters of the FOI that have been highlighted, I can now understand why Police Scotland could not answer that, because actually it didn't define the, the age range that we were looking for, it had a, a, a kind of broader uh, set of parameters. Um, so I'm quite happy to go back and determine what the uh, return for that FI was. Uh, however, if the, if the core question is, do Police Scotland record ages and, um, of victims and witnesses that are retrievable? Um, my answer to that is they're certainly recorded. I would lean on the, uh, the expertise of my APU colleagues, colleagues to see if they're retrievable, but I would anticipate the answer would be yes. Yeah. Could, could I just ask, finally, if you think having this data and the ability to, an, uh, to analyse it would be helpful? Yes, it would be helpful, provided we... Um, I suppose it would be helpful to understand the core um, breakdown of individuals at certain age groups that were victims of crime. That, that may be helpful for this uh, discussion, but what, what the additional information is required for the wider discussion about elder abuse is to understand whether those victims were vulnerable due to age. And I think that is the point that we would have to understand through a manual check. And that's the only, th the only reason you could understand if they were vulnerable through age. OK, I think if we see the, the question and answer, that might be helpful. Can I thank all the witnesses for attending? That's been a very useful session. I suspend um, now to allow the witnesses to leave just for um, one minute. Agenda item two is consideration of whether the Scottish statutory instrument made under the powers conferred on devolved authorities in the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018 has been laid under the appropriate procedure. The instrument is Services of Lawyers and Lawyers Practice, EU Exit Scotland Amendment, etc., Regulations 2019 Draft. I refer members to paper three, which is a note by the clerk, and paper four, which is private paper. The instrument has been laid under the affirmative procedure procedure, the committee will consider the policy content on the instrument at a future meeting. Do members have any comments? No comments from members. Um, uh, therefore, can I ask, is the committee agreed that the affirmative procedure is the appropriate procedure for this instrument? Yes, thank you. The Scottish Government has also categorised this instrument as being medium importance. Are members content with that? You are content. Thank you. That concludes the public part of today's meeting. Our next meeting will be on the 5th of March, when we'll consider a number of items of subordinate legislation. We now move into private session. <laughs>